Welcome, foolish mortals, to an even deeper dive than I anticipated. Dave's Obsession! Dave's Obsession of the Homo Mans. The first Haunted Mansion theatrical film in 20 years is coming soon, but this is far from just the second time that Disney adapted the classic Disneyland ride into a story in another medium. To anticipate this movie, I decided to look back at every single adaptation of the Haunted Mansion that I could find, and I may have bit off more than I can chew here. I'm only counting authorized adaptations, no fan projects. I'm also not counting documentaries about the ride or promotional material that just treats the mansion as a theme park ride. To count for this list, it needs to be something that at least on some level embraces the fiction of the mansion, the idea that this mansion is genuinely haunted by these characters and not just built by Imagineers. I'm also not counting appearances from mansion characters in other park shows and attractions, no parades or fireworks or other in-park activations. If it's in the park, I consider it more of an extension of the attraction than an adaptation. Also, I'm not including toys because I have no idea if there's a comprehensive list of toys built based on the mansion. I've not been able to find anything close to a comprehensive list. And under the banner of toys, I'm not including board games because I really don't have the time or the money to collect them all. Have you seen what Haunted Mansion Clue is going for these days? It's wild. And I'm finally not including unmade adaptations. So no Jim Hill script and no Guillermo del Toro movie. Although my friends at How Did This Not Get Made discussed both of those, and also no unmade 2017 animated series because there's really not much I can say about it other than it looks like it would have been cool. But with all those caveats, let's look at the adaptations that do exist, starting with the first and arguably the most important. The story and song from the Haunted Mansion was the original souvenir vinyl promoting the attraction, a fully produced audio drama narrated by Uncle Theodore himself, Thurl Ravenscroft. It also came with a book. I haven't tracked down a physical copy myself, it wasn't reprinted nearly as often as the audio was re-released, but I found scans of it online. It looks like the book was basically just illustrations of the show scenes with description text that doesn't match the narration audio, so reading along with the record probably wouldn't work, but looking at the pictures while listening was supposed to give you a vague idea of what it's like moving through the mansion. So let's listen to the record while looking at the pictures. Have you ever seen a haunted house? Ooh, do I cut to Peter Graves in Airplane or Jonathan Frakes in Beyond Belief? What a choice. The owners haven't been seen for years. No one really knows why. Well, I assume they left because it was haunted. There's a high vine-covered fence around the property. Is it there to keep somebody out? Or is it there to keep something inside? Or is it strictly decorative to up the house's resale value? One little night not long ago, two teenagers were walking home from a date. Oh god, is it grad night? This is a scary story. It began to rain. Mike and Karen ran toward the old house, through the old iron gate, and onto the porch for protection. Protection? If only they had known. Well, blame the parents for demanding that sex ed be cut from schools. Oh, Mike, look at that rain come down. We'll never get home on time. Sure we will. Karen is voiced by Disneyland Records mainstay Robbie Lester, and Mike is famously voiced by Ron Howard, between Opie Taylor and Richie Cunningham. Of course, he's well cast as average American teen, but imagine what this would have been like with him as the narrator instead. Now the story of a haunted mansion who lost everything, and the happy haunts who had no choice but to follow you home. So the kids move through the sequences of the attraction. It's pretty much the stuff you see in the ride in the order you see it in the ride, but as this was recorded before the ride was finalized, there are a couple of relics of earlier ideas that didn't ever actually make it into the attraction. For instance, one of the unused ideas for the ghost host is canon here. Good evening. Who said that? I think it came from that marble statue. Welcome, Welcome foolish, foolish mortals, mortals, to the, to the haunted, haunted mansion. mansion. The ghost host is voiced by Disney Parks mainstay Pete Renaday, who's not bad, but they clearly didn't realize at the time how immortal Paul Freeze's performance would become. I honestly think it would sound less weird hearing Thurl do the ghost host and Pete do the narration, but I don't make the decisions. As Mike and Karen stepped into the room, the wall behind them slid closed. 
We shouldn't have come in here. I I'm scared. I don't see a way out. There are no doors, not even a window. Boy, I sure hope this doesn't offer me any chilling challenges. Your trusting, trusting mortal, mortal eyes, eyes tell you that these walls are stretching. But logic says, no, it is mere hallucination. The ghost host destroys the stretching room with facts and logic. Your logic cannot deny that this chamber has no windows and no doors. Yeah, that's already been established. Weren't you listening to Opie? Which offers a rather logical challenge to find a way out. Did you just learn the word logic and you're still excited to work it into every sentence? I mean, you still use it more accurately than the winged ones. Lightning flashed from above the room, illuminating the attic area. There seemed to be no roof. From the rafters, a corpse swayed, dangling from a taut rope. Boy, this is much more intense than last time Ronnie saw a hanging body. A black raven flew into the room and perched on the bookcase. Oh yeah, that's another thing that was cut from the mansion before opening, the raven talking. At one point in development, the raven is going to have the ghost host narration. At another point, it was just going to contribute with mild commentary like this. So this is a relic from that time, before the actual version of the raven, who just sits there, occasionally cawing, biding his time before he can prank the guy from Mystery Lodge. Apparently, the restless spirit of an old nag has taken possession of that poor, wretched raven's mortal being. Be on your guard. It may want to better itself. <laughs> I'm supposed to be scared of a raven taking community college classes? Meanwhile, the first page of the book's description breezes through the stretching room in the portrait hallway, while the illustration shows neither. It just shows the raven and... A uh, character who is not mentioned in the text or the audio here. Mike and Karen didn't see an executioner opening the door. They opened it themselves. What's going on here? Who is this guy? I am way more intrigued by executioner doorman than I am by anyone with a hat box. The hallway made a sharp turn into an eerie lit limbo of boundless mist and decay. The furnishings and walls were covered with cobwebs. A staircase seemed to be the only passageway out. There's no doom buggies because this is a house and ride vehicles don't make narrative sense in a house, so the characters just walk through the house. It's a coffin. Something's trying to get out. You've disturbed it yet! Ah, ah. You'll be sorry for that! Ah, ah. Yeah, you're not supposed to annoy other park guests unless you're doing it for TikTok clout. There an unusual seance was in session. We're about, about to participate in a, a seance. Madame Leota is assembling all the spirits. So, Madame Leota is officially the first character on the ride to have their name canonically established. Madame Leota, the medium who was chanting the plaintive incantations, was quite unique. She was truly a disembodied spirit. A mere talking head inside a misty crystal ball. She is, of course, named after the face model, Leota Toombs, who is not involved in this record because, you know, it's just audio. So the thing that canonizes naming her after half of the performance only features the other half of the performance. Serpents and spiders, tail of a rat, call in the spirits wherever they're at. Of course, there's no visual of Leota Tombs, but there is a visual of Madame Leota, and wow, that is an unflattering drawing of Leota. Maybe at this point in development, there was a backstory where she drank from the wrong grail. <laughs> Several ghosts were playing on the chandelier over the massive dining table. Others were waltzing while an organist played a haunting refrain. Now, at no point do the kids notice that the organ looks a lot like Captain Nemo's, but, you know, why would they? It's not like this ghost host would ever turn out to be Captain Nemo in Florida, in a defunct attraction. Mike and Karen entered the door and came face to face with a ghost dressed as a bride. 
She was strangely illuminated, and her heart glowed red with each heartbeat. The room they were in was an unfinished attic. And as they turned to run out of the door, another ghostly manifestation appeared and blocked their way. Yes, the true reason this is historically significant. For years, it was the official confirmation that the Hatbox ghost was supposed to be in this ride. Now, it wasn't the confirmation that he ever actually was in the ride, because lots of things that didn't make it into the ride made it into the record. That had to be determined much later. But it proved that he was at least supposed to exist, leading to his own cult fandom within the Haunted Mansion cult fandom within the Disney Parks cult fandom. Cult within cult within cult within cult cult within cult within cult within cult. He was a cloaked figure with an evil grinning face. Evil, silly, I always get those mixed up. A hat box hung from his hand. With each beat of his bride's heart, his head disappeared from his body and appeared in the hat box. It is funny that the attic resident who actually stuck around doesn't make it into the illustration here. At least not in the scans I found, which I'm assuming are comprehensive, but what do I know? I'm doing a lot of eighth-hand research here. We're trapped. There's no way out. Hold the candles. I'll try to open this window. Come on. We're in luck. There's a balcony out here. There's some steps down at the far end. Okay, so this version of the story doesn't cotton to the we fell out of the window interpretation. There's just stairs outside the attic. That's less exciting. They passed an old caretaker holding a lantern, too frightened to speak. You'd think the kids would at least try to speak to him, you know? I'd be pretty happy to see another living soul in their position, but maybe they're just antisocial. Then Thurl's speaking voice gives way to his singing voice. His dog was cowering at his feet. We get a little description of some of the graveyard residents, but not all of them. There's just too many. Behind the hearse on a hill, a group of ghosts were enjoying a bicycle ride through the tombstones. A huge masked executioner was singing a duet with a decapitated knight. Who oh, there's the executioner in the part of the ride that actually has an executioner. The illustrations just put him in the exact opposite end of the ride for reasons. There's that raven again. And we kind of get hitchhiking ghost acknowledgement, at least the idea of them, but they're not really mentioned in the audio, even though they are showcased in illustration. Ah, ah, beware, my friends. Ah, ah, they may try to follow you home. Ah, ah, ah. I feel like the people working on the two halves of this souvenir were not communicating with each other. It looks like there's something up ahead. <gasps> That's a crypt. That's the one by the fence. It's the way out. Okay, so the audio implies that Karen knows that's the way out because she recognizes the crypt from the entrance, but the book text makes it sound like the crypt is the exit. This uninviting crypt would scare most people, but for us it is a welcoming sight. It is our escape from a living nightmare in the haunted mansion. Which is more accurate to the ride where you kind of exit through the crypt, but it makes less sense narratively. Did you enjoy your visit? And the ghost host leaves it on a spooky, but kind of uplifting note. I told you you would not be harmed. Thank, Thank you for spending some time, time with us. us. Come, Come back, back again. Bring, Bring your, your friends. friends. If, if they will leave the story you tell. tell. I have to go now. It's, it's midnight. midnight. Pleasant dreams. You've survived the haunted mansion and lived to tell the tale, but you'll be back. Will it be on your own terms? 
Only time will tell. So the record and the illustrations don't really go together that tightly, but individually they're each the gold standard of a souvenir memento from a theme park attraction. Aside from the elements that were changed before opening, it's a pretty straightforward, direct adaptation of the story of the ride. It just happens to two fictional teenagers instead of happening to you. It's the basic most way to adapt a Haunted Mansion story, and it set the standard for a lot of the adaptations to come. Our next Mansion story is called Spooky Tenants from October 19th. 1969. This is apparently a short story from Walt Disney Comics Digest, but it's not a comic strip. It's a text-based short story with some illustrations, I think. The only version of this I found is on the Haunted Mansion's fandom wiki, which posts the pictures and then has what purports to be the full text of the story just in the body of the wiki article, and I'm just taking it at the wiki's word that this is what was printed in the actual magazine, but the scans are cropped to just the images, so I don't know. This could just be someone's fanfic that they're trying to Mandela affect us into believing was printed in this magazine, like a really low-stakes version of Wag the Dog. But I have no particular reason to not trust the Haunted Mansion fandom wiki, so I will take it at their word that this is how the story goes, unless I am proven otherwise at some point in the future. Now this is the first, but not the last, mansion story to feature Mickey and the gang, as Goofy has been dealing with some annoying ghosts. Goofy, I just painted those steps, protested Mickey. Sorry, Mick, but I'm too tired to move. I haven't had a night's sleep in two weeks. All night long, this guy rides his bicycle right through my room. A guy rides his bicycle through your room? Said Mickey. Yes, and there's another guy that sits on the stairs and shuffles a pack of cards and laughs. Sometimes, when talking to Goofy, Mickey felt he had come in the middle of the late, late show. Which means on the open road is just a carpool karaoke number. Well, I don't really mind them, Goofy went on. They don't hurt anything and they sure don't need anything but they're so darn noisy. So Goofy naps at Mickey's house while Mickey researches the ghost's identity. Remember the old Harker house? Mickey asked his friend. It was torn down a little over two weeks ago. There was a story about it in the paper. Everyone always said that it was haunted. Well, I looked it up in the library. I think the ghost with the bicycle must be old Jonathan Harker. Jonathan Harker? From Dracula? That's a pretty big name ghost to end up with Goofy. The ghost with the cards would be Jonathan's nephew, Ebenezer. He liked to play cards. His wife liked to go to parties, so she used to steal one or two cards out of every deck he bought. Not sure I understand the cause and effect there. She liked to go to parties, so she stole cards? I like to make videos, so I eat tacos. You get the connection. He never had a full deck. It bothered him so much that he had a fit of apoplexy and died. Oh god, is fretting over losing something small fatal now? As if I needed more anxiety every time I can't find my keys. When they tore down the old Harker house, Mickey went on, the ghosts lost their home. I suppose they wandered around for a night or two and then found your place, which is, sir... Uh, well, I know, said Goofy with a good nature. It's kind of run down and spooky looking. Well, yeah, your address is still listed as a bounce house, even though it hasn't been a bounce house in 17 years. Get your craft together, Goof. I'm sorry, Goofy, said Mickey. But this is an awfully ordinary house. Your ghost could be at a really great haunted house. So Mickey lures the ghost out of Goofy's house by negging Goofy's house. The house I'm thinking of will be perfect for the Harkers. It was built for ghosts. I like this backstory. There's no sea captain or Master Gracie. Nobody ever lived in the mansion. It was always built exclusively for ghosts. I wonder what the zoning permits are on that. I never thought I'd get rid of a bunch of ghosts by sending them to Disneyland, laughed Goofy. With the Haunted Mansion open, where else would you send a homeless spook? Said Mickey Mouse. So this is the first piece of ancillary media I found to purport that the actual attraction, physically in Disneyland, is a real haunted house with real ghosts. The story and song put the mansion in Anytown, USA, but this says that when you go to Disneyland, you are seeing real ghosts, including the ghost of Jonathan Harker, presumably. But otherwise, it's not really an adaptation of the mansion, it's just a story set in a world where the mansion is real, so I can't really judge it as a translation of the mansion's story and tone to a new medium, but as a potential backstory for some of the ghosts, it works as well as any. Next up in 1970, there was a read-along. I am going to begin now to read the story of The Haunted Mansion. You can read along with me in your book. This is a book and record, which is completely different than the record and book from a year earlier. Sure, it's got a similar art style, and sure, it's read by Robbie Lester who played Karen in the earlier record, and sure, it also has the Hatbox Ghost. 
I swear I'm going somewhere with this. Oh, in this case, the text on the page is the same as the text in the audio. You know, this is an actual read-along. That's the difference. Have you ever been in a haunted mansion? I have. See, the earlier record asked if you'd ever seen a haunted house, not if you'd ever been in one. I entered the open front door and was greeted by a ghostly voice. Good evening. Welcome to the Haunted Mansion. Still got a picture of a doorman executioner that we're absolutely not going to mention, I guess. Was that the original pitch for the cast member uniforms or something? We, my ghost host voice and I, went into the art gallery. The paintings were very strange. They seemed to be stretching. Okay, this book expands on the earlier one by actually showing a picture of the stretching room. See, it's not just a condensed version of the earlier record, it's also that book's The Stuff We Missed episode. Madame Leota was a spirit. In fact, she was just a head in a crystal ball. Okay, this Leota looks unflattering in a completely different way. She looks like Madame Mim. I tried to get help from the caretaker, but he was more frightened than I. Well, at least you tried this time, Robbie. Last time you barely acknowledged him. Down the path I went. I passed a group of singing minstrels who paid no attention to me at all. A group of cats and a family of owls joined in spooky harmony. Most of these residents don't look all that ghostly. Also, all four of these owls are clearly Archimedes. Is this just Sword in the Stone? At last, my venture was over. I was frightened, but intrigued. I'd like to visit that house again and unravel its mysteries. So yeah, it's similar to the other record, but even more abridged, and with only one voice. Now we move on to television. And now, tonight's program, Disneyland Showtime. This one just barely counts, but it's historically significant enough that I felt it warranted a mention. This is the official television premiere of The Haunted Mansion after opening, as its only prior television presence, as far as I know, was in the Disneyland 10th anniversary special, when it was still in development and Walt still hadn't figured out its name. Haunted Mansion and, uh, and uh, Supernatural. This special, however, was post-Walt, so it needed new affable hosts to be the face of Disneyland, introducing the audience to the new wonders in the park, so they went with the Osmond Brothers, E.J. Peeker, fresh off of Hello, Dolly, and some flavor of the month Disney child actor who probably never went on to anything else, something like Russell Curtis, I don't know. The bulk of this special features the fun-loving celebrities who are supposed to be at a very specific Disney event or meeting, goofing off while being pursued by a fuddy-duddy trying to keep them on track, following in the grand tradition of the Reluctant Dragon, a tradition that would continue on to the California Adventure special. Donnie expresses desire early on to see the Haunted Mansion, but most of the special is his family looking for him while he he wanders around more aimlessly than he does in the background of the white and nerdy video, interrupted occasionally by musical numbers. Eventually, after the Osmonds do their show, Donnie does get to ride the mansion, and Kurt shows us how it was all built. But they still maintain the premise that the mansion really is a retirement home for real ghosts, so the conceit here is that the Imagineers and the Illusioneers created the special effects in their quest to make the ghosts comfortable. And the ghosts they built themselves were like... Vessels for the real ghosts? When word got out of Walt Disney's plans for a haunted mansion, the ghost relations department at Wed Enterprises was deluged with inquiries from assorted ghosts and haunts who were dying to get a look at it. Some of the ethereal inhabitants were much too shy to be seen by mortals, and mechanical substitutes had to be devised to make them visible. A system was developed by the people at Disney to control the movements of the ghostly inhabitants of the haunted mansion through the use of scalloped edge discs. So there are real ghosts here who really chose to come here to retire at the Disneyland Mansion, but their movements are under Disney's control and they have no free will. Was that a selling point in the brochure? Probably the single most difficult problem faced by the illusionaires at WED was that posed by some of the more bashful boarders who refused to show their faces. Also, we get thorough soloing his lines without the rest of the busts. <sighs> As the moon climbs high over the dead oak tree. Creepy creeps with eerie eyes. Grim grin and ghosts come out to socialize. The haunted mansion was an idea of Walt Disney's. You see, he began to worry where ghosts were going to live after all the old houses were torn down to make room for freeways. He decided that if someone didn't give him a house to live in, why, they'd just disappear. I mean, Walt could have used his influence to stop Judge Doom, but he wouldn't be a real capitalist unless he just applied a band-aid without getting to the root of a systemic issue. Oh, 
boy, but I'm sure glad it's not Halloween tonight. Well, how come, Donnie? Because I'm not that big a Nightmare Before Christmas fan. Then the cast goes on an abridged ride-through of the attraction with mild commentary, and this is the primary source for most of the stock footage Disney has used of the ride in the years to follow. At least until the invention of HD video. And after the ride, Donnie wants to ride again, but he goes in the wrong direction for the entrance, so it's here we go again, as ghosts from all over the world come to live in the mansion. So it's a mild blending of fact and fiction, but there's just enough embracing of the reality of the mansion and enough historical significance for it to count for this video. Next up, we get another TV special, which has possibly even less to do with the narrative of the mansion, but I really had to include this one. From Walt Disney Productions, Mickey Mouse proudly presents The Mouse Factory. This is an episode of The Mouse Factory, an anthology series from 1972 where a celebrity host would introduce clips and segments from Disney shorts and features, all centered around a theme. One episode, Spooks and Magic, is treated as a Halloween episode, even though it aired on February 16th. The scary part is that you missed Valentine's Day. The framing device is set at the mansion, and it's hosted by... <laughs> Welcome to Diller's Midnight Manor. I'm your ghost host. Phyllis Diller as the ghost host. That casting is just so wrong and yet so right at the same time. Let me show you around the ground. Watch the gate, Clyde. Okay, the first name we're given for the groundskeeper is Clyde. Yeah, it won't be the last. We get some footage of non-mansion things, then footage of mansion things recycled from Disneyland Showtime, all with light snark. Over here are complete recreational facilities for our physical fitness program. These jokes aren't anything special, but they do fit in with the mansion's tone. Maybe it doesn't sound that way coming from Diller, but if Paul Fries had read them, each one of these jokes would be plastered all over 5,000 t-shirts on Etsy. In fact, here's a few of the actual Phyllis Diller jokes in this special, read as if the ghost host was reading them. Over here are complete recreational facilities for our physical fitness program, our retirement plan, is the living end. Now there's a night to remember. <laughs> the Over 400 Club is having a little party for the lately departed. Legitimately could fit. How do you like the guest room? Cool, Lenore. <laughs> the Raven's named Lenore. And since they never implemented its dialogue, it will be speaking nevermore. But this device has got to frame something, so after a termite problem, Ghost Host Diller calls up some archive footage. Hello! If I didn't know better, I'd say a mouse just answered. Well, yeah, whose factory did you think this was? So we get an abridged version of Lonesome Ghosts that we're pretending is happening in the mansion, which is not so far-fetched. Because at one point in early development, the Imagineers considered including the Lonesome Ghosts in the attraction. This didn't end up happening, of course, but this special places them as mansion residents, who apparently have so little respect for the ghost host that they mess with the exterminators she hired. And it probably comes as no surprise that this is not the last time we'll see the lonesome ghosts in one of these adaptations. I better give those exterminators a warning not before I go in. Hi, fellas. It's just me. Run for your life! She turned to slime action somehow! So then Phyllis wants to watch TV, and she invites over Disney characters playing the role of Universal characters. Oh, here they are now. Hi, gang! Why, it's a costume party. Why are you wearing your street clothes? It's okay, Wolfman, you sit right over there. Yes, and Hunchback, you sit over there next to Wolfman. And Dracula, uh, if you don't mind, sit as far away from my neck as possible. <laughs> And little Dagenstein, you sit right over here. I'll be sitting next to you. But my favorite relative of all times was Annie Mim. I inherited my hair from her side of the family. Madam Mim in a crystal ball. The read-alongs prophecy came true. So we get an abridged version of the wizard stool from Sword in the Stone, and then Phyllis tries to send her ghost guests home. Come on, gang. Out. Show's over. Well, don't just sit there. Come on. Right 
Okay. I warned you. This will teach you. I want a ghoul just like the ghoul that buried dear old Doug. Okay, I will pay Disney as much as they want to build an animatronic Phyllis Diller, put her at a piano singing that cacophony, and place it in the graveyard scene out of sync with everyone else singing Grim Grinning Ghosts. It's not more out of place than Robot Ellen was. Now what's going on here? You call this soup swill? Man, Goofy's a real utility player here, showing up in different roles in every sequence. He really was the Phil Hartman of Mouse Factory. Which Goofy? You take the east side. Martha, you take the north side. And which Hazel, you get the depressed area here where Donald Duck lives. Now, out with you, on the double. So we get an abridged version of Trick or Treat, the Donald Duck short where June Foray played a witch named Witch Hazel. You know, before all those Looney Tunes shorts where June Foray played a different witch named Witch Hazel. Trick or Treat, a trick or treater. <laughs> I've got just the treat for you, dearie. And in our final segment, Phyllis tries to kill Snow White. But Snow White's too smart for that now. So we get some glitchy transmogrification. Hocus pocus, you're a toad. <laughs> Something's wrong with this thing. <laughs> what in the world is happening? <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with this wigged out wand? Aha! That's better! <laughs> Remember, kids, when you meet Snow White in the park, it might be Phyllis Diller in disguise. Happy Halloween in February! And then there's a The End card where Disney feeds their icon to another monster who would later become a universal icon. Bob Gurr, you traitor! This thing is great. I mean, it's not great like it's a faithful adaptation of the tone of the mansion or anything, but it's great in the same way Gilbert Gottfried in the Tower of Terror is great. My only plus up would be add some more mansion iconography and maybe add the skeleton dance to the shorts lineup, but for 1970s Disney variety television, this is just the right amount of stupid to be absolutely perfect. I love this thing. Then there's a pretty long gap in adaptations that I've been able to find. I haven't found anything for the rest of the 70s or anything at all for the 80s. I'm sure Disney Disney must have done something with the mansion iconography in those 18 years, but I haven't found it. If they have, let me know if you do. The next adaptations I have been able to find don't come until 1990. Now, I thought about including the Disneyland 35th anniversary special, you know, where a ghost girl dances with young Woody Boyd, but that doesn't really treat the mansion as being real. It just happens to separately be haunted, unrelated to its fictional haunted status. Like, yeah, there's a ghost girl, but like none of the mansion ghosts are treated as real. She's just an unrelated ghost who happens to be there. So no, this is not going to be yet another video where I babble about the Cheers Disney crossover universe. But if you want another one of those, you don't need to ask twice. The next proper adaptation I could find was released 6,680 days after the Mouse Factory episode. If they had just released this 20 days earlier, we could have kept to a spooky theme, but no. But this is a big one because June 1st, 1990, saw the release of the first video game representation I have been able to find of the Haunted Mansion. I refer, of course, to Adventures in the Magic Kingdom for the NES, one of many beloved Disney games made by Cap. Capcom. In this game, Goofy has lost the keys to the castle, and you have to find them by getting to the end of attraction minigames and by answering trivia. Now, before we get any further, yes, the title is Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, but the mansion exterior in the game looks more like the Disneyland mansion, and the castle on the box art is Cinderella's castle, but the castle in the game looks more like Sleeping Beauty's castle plopped on top of the Great Wall of China. And the map layout doesn't resemble any existing park, but it's 
closer to Disneyland Park than to Magic Kingdom, Florida. And that's mostly because this is a relic of a time when Disney wasn't quite as precious about specific nomenclature and their branding, and often used the phrase Magic Kingdom to refer not specifically to Magic Kingdom Park in Florida, but to the general idea of a Disneyland-style Magic Kingdom Park. Disneyland itself was frequently referred to as the Magic Kingdom before there even was a Florida park. So when this game advertises itself as Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, it's not saying that it's Adventures in the Magic Kingdom trademark park located at 11807 Seas Drive, Lake Buena Vista, Florida 32830. It means Adventures in a hypothetical amalgamation of all Magic Kingdoms. Adventures in the idea of a Magic Kingdom. That way they're legally not claiming that this is the adventure you'll have when you visit any specific Magic Kingdom because the Haunted Mansion at all those is an Omnimover ride and not a side-scrolling platformer. But here, the Haunted Mansion is just one of your quests on your way to find the six keys that unlock the not-specifically-branded castle. As you begin your quest, Mickey gives you the Dennis Nedry pose as he cheerfully warns you that you might could die. Then if you do die, he gives you the same pose and callously tells you to try again. So the level begins, and the first thing you see is this really scary ghost guy, and if you touch him now, it's insta-death. And instead of friendly Mickey shaming you, it's scary ghost guy shaming you. Traumatizing. The first part of the level is the cemetery, most likely meant to reflect the queue outside the ride, but borrowing a little from the graveyard scene in the ride, and also adding Nosferatu zombies! Nothing like that in the ride. You can kill them by throwing a single candle at them. The main thing borrowed from the graveyard scene is the heads popping up behind the gravestones. Some of them are Dracula. Some of them are... Fido Dido. Then you move inside the mansion where you can start collecting more candles to throw at enemies and the scary ghost guy does like a Scooby-Doo mirror gag. He doesn't go quite full Groucho and Harpo with it and it's not quite hitchhiking ghost either since his reflection doesn't appear alongside yours, but hey, it's cute for, you know, being scary. And we get bottomless pits, which, you know, are in the ride, but not as far as guests know. We get falling chandeliers, which aren't in the ride. And we get hands that reach out of coffins, which I guess is a reference to the coffin occupant, except the lid was finally removed and suddenly he's lost interest in getting out and now he just wants to drag you in. Also, he's lying lengthwise in the coffin? Or he's just placing his hands weirdly? Or he has a companion in there with him? No wonder he lost interest in getting out. Have fun, you two. Oh, and also, while the zombies can be killed with one candle hit, each hand takes three. You got some strong-ass hands there, Rockbiter. Then you ride this flying chair up to the upper level, where you're in the ballroom, and we get our most explicit bit of iconography from the ride thus far, the ballroom dancers. And they seem to be minding their own business, but they still hurt you if they touch you, so you gotta kill them. I don't want to, they're just having a nice time. They're not hurting anybody. Well, except me, but I feel bad killing these lovers in the turtle embrace. But the castle key isn't gonna find itself, so die, dancers! Then there's some tedious platforming as you hop across floating chairs and chandeliers, and you eventually find a different shaped floating chair, which takes you up to the attic for even more tedious platforming, as you ride a floating chair over a bottomless pit and try not to get knocked over by flying books. Then you jump across chairs that will fall shortly after you land on them, all while avoiding swooping ghosts who look like parrots, and finally you ride one last chair up to the boss battle. The singing busts are there, although their placement is more reminiscent of the watchful busts. And there's plenty of candles to stock up on as the scary ghost guy comes in for the attack. And you gotta fight him off. And once you defeat him, Goofy gives you the key. Isn't Goofy the one who lost the keys in the first place? I'm starting to suspect the narrative of this game wasn't intricately crafted by an author with a master plan. Anyway, two and a half months later, in August of 1990, the Disney sing-along songs line released Disneyland Fun, the first Disney sing-along songs video to consist mostly of original footage and not just musical numbers from movies framed with redubbed Professor Owl, Jiminy Cricket, or Ludwig von Drake footage. This one features surprisingly few Disneyland songs, mostly other songs that can be framed around Disneyland attractions and experiences, but one of the handful of Disneyland songs it features is Grim Grinning Ghosts. And even though this scene potentially only takes place in a little girl's imagination, I have to include it because this was my only exposure to the mansion when I was a spineless little coward boy. Boy, this place is creepy. Yeah. 
I wonder what weird things happen here at night. Yeah, I was too scared to ride the ride as a kid, and then I didn't really end up going to Disneyland Park during my teenage years, so my first ride on the mansion wasn't until my 22nd birthday. As a kid, all I knew of the mansion was this, and even this was almost too scary for me. If you ask me what the Haunted Mansion was, I'd say it's the place where all the villains congregate and have a spooky party. The scary Snow White trees are dancing until the scary Snow White witch reveals herself with a cartoon sound effect, all while Thurl sings a way slowed down version of Grim Grinning Ghosts. The haunts materialize and begin to vocalize. Grim Grinning Ghosts come out to socialize. Again, as a kid, this was the version I knew. When I finally rode the ride, I was shocked at how up-tempo the real version of the song is. The witch does this weird tiptoe and head turn between the columns, disappearing behind the columns, followed by the wolf, Captain Hook, and... The witch again, and this was real unsettling as a child, but I think having Captain Hook there was reassuring because... At least he was a villain I knew, right? And I knew how silly and non-threatening he really was. So that might have helped me not to be too, too scared, knowing that there was someone here I could handle. And then someone I could really handle was Donald in a sheet as a ghost. Okay, Donald's just being silly. Yeah, he's in a terrifying place, but Donald's a good guy. This is gonna be okay. Although, come to think of it, I was just assuming that it is Donald. The video doesn't offer any proof that it is Donald specifically. It could be any duck. Maybe it's Magicka Dispel, and I should have been scared. Well, I was about to get scared again anyway, because now it's time for actual footage of the ride interior, and I had no idea what I was looking at here as a kid who had never ridden this thing. But hey, this is the only appearance we get of any Haunted Mansion characters in the Haunted Mansion portion of this Disneyland video. But we're about to get a character who shares a voice with the mansion character, Maleficent. Shiny, wet Maleficent with a prosthetic Jay Leno chin. Come out to socialize. That boo is objectively very silly, and yet it scared the crap out of me as a child. I don't know if that says more about the video or more about me as a child, but it definitely says a lot about something. And then all the villains dance together. They're just having a good time. It may not be mansion characters, but it is true to the mansion spirit of scary people just having fun. Then everyone stops dancing, the villains disappear, the trees stop moving, and the girl stops dissociating. Danielle. Hey, Danielle. Let's go. As a child, this segment scared the crap out of me and also intrigued me, just like the mansion is supposed to. So even though it doesn't feature that much in the way of mansion characters or iconography, just the exterior and a little bit of B-roll, for little child me, it was the perfect tonal adaptation of the Haunted Mansion, and it set me up to love it when I finally rode the ride as a recent college grad. Side note, there was also a Disneyland Paris sing-along video in 1993 that used many of the same songs from Disneyland Fun, and it also has a grim grinning ghost sequence, but since that's based on Phantom Manor, which is a distinct story from the Haunted Mansion, I'm not covering it here. So let's jump to 1994 when we got a couple of Haunted Mansion adaptations, starting with a pop-up book. I bought this used copy online that was advertised as being in pretty good condition, and you know, it starts out in pretty good condition. Of course, then it's um, missing some things. Some pages are not in uh, great shape. Um, yeah, pretty good is a relative term when it comes to pop-up books. Fortunately, I did find someone else on YouTube who has an actual good copy of this, who demonstrated all the things as they're supposed to work. By and large, the special effects in the ride are translated to pop-up effects quite effectively. I swear for once I'm not going for a pun, I just couldn't think of a better way to word that. Many of the things that move in the ride move similarly here thanks to pop-up technology. And interestingly enough, Leota didn't move in the ride at the time, but her table floats around here not dissimilarly from the way her head would float around 11 years later. There are some missed opportunities, like I feel like the bride's beating heart could have been translated to a pop-up effect, but 
Removing the veil for a scary face works too, I guess. We also should end with the hitchhiking ghosts and have, you know, you pull the tab and they move their thumbs or maybe have a pop-up effect where they appear in a doom buggy they previously weren't in. But the hitchhiking ghosts instead make a non-pop-up cameo on page one, which feels wrong. I guess the text on each page also would be better if more of it came directly from Exitensio, but despite any missed opportunities here, this is pretty cool as pop-up books go. Maybe I'll find a less broken copy of my own someday. Also in 1994, we got something I've spoken about before, the television series Walt Disney World Inside Out. The Halloween episode of the Disney World promotional series features several segments, including a look at the resort's wardrobe department that kind of borrows a gag from the aforementioned Mouse Factory episode. Getting kind of tired of being a werewolf, so I was wondering, can you use your magical powers to turn me back into my old, beautiful self? Well, it's not exactly what I had in mind. But of course it had to feature a Haunted Mansion segment. A pretty brief one. Like, oh crap, we forgot to include our most famous spooky thing in our Halloween episode, what can we throw together last minute level brief. In this segment, host Scott Harriet riffs on the happy haunts. Do the uh, Broncos have a shot this year? Hello? Serpents and spiders. Hello? Tail of a rat. So I'm at the dead concert, I'm having a great time, right? And uh, there's gar- never mind. Check! Now, uh, after the reception, did everyone get heartburn? And the reason this counts for this video is that it does confirm the existence of hitchhiking ghosts. Well, the Haunted Mansion's always been one of my favorites. Hitchhiking ghosts. <laughs> I don't think so. And the hitchhiking ghost is... another Scott. It'd be kind of redundant if he saw that guy in the mirror at the end of the ride. Eh, it's nothing special. It's okay as far as Walt Disney World Inside Out segments go, but it's been severely overshadowed by the aforementioned Tower of Terror segment earlier in the same episode. Oh, hi. I'm Gilbert Gottfried, and I'm wearing a fuzzy pink bathrobe. Come on. Let's go solve the mystery. And then on December 16th came the final adaptation from 1994, our next video game to feature the Haunted Mansion, a game released only in Japan for the Super Famicom, whose title translates as Mickey's Grand Adventure in Tokyo Disneyland. This is a game where Mickey has to gather all his friends for the big show, navigating platform levels based on Tokyo Disneyland attractions using both helium and water balloons. The Haunted Mansion level starts off immediately with more recognizable mansion iconography than Adventures in the Magic Kingdom did by showing us a stretching room portrait. And it's actually a squash and stretch portrait. Okay, that's not the way those portraits stretch, but uh the spirit is there, and in this first part of the mansion, Mickey has to go up, which I actually think is a pretty clever way of adapting the feeling of the stretching room to a game mechanic in a side-scroller. There's no hanging body at the top, just a ghost below you that will catch you if you fail, which I learned from bitter experience because I'm bad at video games. Fortunately, if this ghost gets you, you don't lose a life, only one health point, but you do have to start over from the bottom of the stretching room. Then there's the Hall of Doors, and each door leads to another passage where you have to do... something. One of the passages is yet another tall climbing thing, because Tokyo didn't have a Tower of Terror yet, so they had to put all their tall bits into the Haunted Mansion. You have to race this ghost up to the top of the stairs to get to the door before he blocks it, and you have to land on these buttons to open the stairs while he just gets to float up to the top. It's tedious and frustrating. But if you beat him to that door, you went to the library, where the watchful busts are... Just kind of minding their own business, so I want to leave them alone, but the door is locked and there's nothing else in this room, so I guess I gotta attack them. And when I do, books fall on me and hurt me. Okay. When I attack a bust, I can move under his ledge so the books don't hit me. But if I'm under his ledge when he's finally defeated, he might hurt me on his way out. Complicated. Anyway, once you defeat them all, the door opens and you... Push this button on this machine. Then you go back to the entrance, back down the stairs, back to the hall of doors for another passage. This one's got knights you can either defeat or avoid, then you gotta navigate this little underground tunnel without falling in a bottomless pit and dying of starvation. Then you gotta trigger both these buttons at the same time to open the door, which requires two water balloons, and is probably not actually that tricky to get timing-wise, but it was for me because I suck at video games. But you make it into the door, into the next hallway, which is just loaded with knights, but you run to the end, open another door, trigger another machine, and try to make it back without dying. I failed. Fortunately, continuing from a game over did not send me back to the bottom of the stretching room, just the corridor of doors. 
but I did have to redo the parts I already did, which was obnoxious. Then I gave up on this game and just watched a video on YouTube. So it looks like the next passage had paintings and doors that fall, then you go into a hall with bad guys in disguise as treasure chests, and a button on the ceiling, then that opens the door to the room with real treasure chests and another machine. Then one last tall room where you have to tediously balloon your way up until you get to a ledge, go in a door, go in another door, and you're in the seance room. And then you have to throw water balloons at Madame Leota, and I don't love the idea of fighting her, but I like that the floating instruments are like her shield. That's a fun way to adapt ride iconography to a game mechanic. Anyway, once she disappears, the door opens, another machine. Once you've triggered all four machines, the door that let you in now leads you out to the graveyard. Which has, you know, ghosts floating around and some popping up behind headstones. That one might be the beating heart bride, it's hard to tell. Then you make it through and you throw water balloons at Ghost Feet. And that's the mansion level. I like the aesthetics of this game, the visuals are great, the mansion looks so fun rendered into these graphics. This looks much better than Adventures in the Magic Kingdom's mansion level but the gameplay here is even more tedious. I got mild enjoyment out of the balloon mechanic, but only mild, and each task to progress through the mansion was just frustrating. Clearly, I am not a hardcore enough gamer to handle commercials for theme parks starring Mickey Mouse designed for children. The next year would see the publication of Enter If You Dare, Scary Tales from the Haunted Mansion, written by Nicholas Stevens and illustrated by Sergio Martinez. This is an anthology of short stories, and it seems like it's Disney trying to do their own version of Goosebumps or Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. The same team also published one based on Pirates of the Caribbean, which I did not buy and have not read because it's not relevant to this video, but, you know, maybe someday if the people demand it. But for now, let's read this book, starting with the foreword. Welcome, dear friend, to my humble homestead. Well, I guess that's more polite than foolish mortals. Sit right down, take a chair, and we'll see if you get to the end. <laughs> Look, my attention span's not what it used to be, but I think I can make it through 75 pages. Our first story is called The Fortune Teller. It centers on two boys, an arrogant kid named Joe Lambert and a scared kid named Luis Rodriguez, who lose their football in the Haunted Mansion graveyard, and they encounter a strange figure. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Ezekiel. I work for Madame Blackheart, who just moved into the big house there. Hey, this book gave Leota a last name. Neat. Leota Blackheart, psychic at law. I gotta get myself a Disney Plus pitch meeting. Oh, Madame Blackheart doesn't just live there, said Ezekiel. She works there too. Madame is a seer, a fortune teller. Perhaps you boys would like to come inside and see what the future holds. So Joe pressures Louise into entering the mansion and meeting with Leota, and Ezekiel takes them inside. Just then, Ezekiel returned, smiling his ghastly smile. Madam Blackheart, we'll see you now. He led the boys into a cavernous parlor. Your cavernous parlor betrays an aura of foreboding. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. On the table sat a round object a little larger than a basketball. It was draped with black velvet. I bet that's a crystal ball, right? Joe asked Ezekiel. Ezekiel gazed at the covered object. There was something in his eyes, something wild and terrified. It is the source of all of Madame's power, he whispered. Oh, okay, so it's gonna be a twist that her head is in the ball. Probably would be a more effective twist if we didn't know this was based on the Haunted Mansion, but hey. So a human woman shows up with her head covered in a veil, sits down and lifts the cloth and looks into the crystal ball. I shall begin, Madame Blackheart said. Murmuring and swaying, she peered at the round object beneath the black cloth. One of you, she said suddenly, shall grow to be a man of wealth and prominence. That would be yours truly, Joe said, elbowing Luis. And the other? Madame Blackheart's voice rose, becoming thin and shrill like an icy wind. The other shall spend all of his days in an asylum for the hopelessly insane. Man, Goofus and Gallant is way more intense than I remember. So so even Joe's a bit creeped out by this to the point that he leaves his football behind and wants to go back for it the next night. That's my genuine autograph, Joe Montana. I gotta get it back. My grandfather gave me that ball. Maybe you should use a less cherished ball to play catch with. P. 
period, let alone next to a haunted mansion? So the kids sneak into the mansion, Joe gets his ball, but temptation overtakes him and he looks inside the crystal ball to see a woman's living head. Who could have seen this coming? Madam Blackheart's body shows up, takes off the veil, and reveals no head, just a bloody stump. In his fear, Joe knocks over the table, shatters the glass ball, and scrambles to leave with his football, but he accidentally grabs the lifeless woman's head instead. So, this Haunted Mansion book kills off Madame Leota for reals in the first chapter. Bold. Later, Louise passes the mansion and sees the freshly dug graves for both Madame Blackheart's body and her head with the new headstone. I'll give it this. I don't know how good a Haunted Mansion story it is, but it's a much better Twilight Zone episode than Tower of Terror. Chapter 2 is The Face in the Mirror, where Sarah Jane Way keeps seeing a scary ghost over her shoulder in her reflection, and keeps seeing her own reflection become deformed. She goes to the stable to ride her horse, and discovers a photo of the man who's been haunting her. It's Jake McKeith, who built the stable a hundred years ago. Yep, old Jake had a colorful life. Miss Shay said. Fought in the Civil War, then bought this place. Which side did he fight on? Is this set in New Orleans Square or Liberty Square? It's a pretty important question. He's buried in the cemetery in that old abandoned mansion beyond the riding trails. You know, the place over by Sedgwick Park. I assume Sedgwick Park is what the locals call Tom Sawyer's Island. Why is Jake buried there? Sarah asked. Story goes that he was in love with the widow of the mansion's original owner. I guess she's the one who had him buried there. I like how we don't know if the widow was in love with him too. This could have been a pity bury. Anyway, Sarah goes riding. The horse gets spooked by a snake and runs wild. She sees Jake in a puddle reflection, but he's warning her, and she ducks just in time to not hit the branch that killed him a hundred years ago. So it turns out Jake is an exceptionally helpful ghost. That's a more positive outcome than the first story. Next is Music to Their Ears, where Brandon Morell's older brothers try to bully him out of playing his clarinet, so he goes to play at the grave yard and he hears other musicians join in. He ends up playing a concert for skeletons, a skeleton dance if you will, and he's warned that he has to keep playing for the entire party or else he's doomed. There's no stopping. So clearly this is a warning against trying to make a career out of your artistic passion. You think it's going to be fun, but then you just have to keep doing it forever. Speaking of warnings, next is The Eyes Have It, where one of those predatory modeling agencies seems to be being run out of the mansion as a vain teen girl gets her photo taken and it ends up stealing her soul? I think? Yeah, this one had even less to do with the mansion as we know it than the other stories. But the final story is Late for the Wedding, which is the second of these stories to actually use specific mansion iconography because it's a possible backstory for the Beating Heart Bride. Basically, a cranky old man died, his daughter died years ago, he had forbidden her from marrying her love as long as he was alive, but now that he's not, her boyfriend, now an old man, digs her up and marries her with her heart still beating in her chest. So... I think it's sweet and romantic in a creepy way, but it could also just be creepy in a creepy way. It could just be skeleton fetish porn. Look, when I said I had the attention span for 75 pages, I was expecting those pages to have a lot more to do with the Haunted Mansion. Yeah, I just gotta be honest. If it wasn't for the first and the last story, I would not think this book had anything to do with the Disney Haunted Mansion. You could republish the other stories under a different title and I would not make the connection. Sure, some of the elements are evocative of memorable mansion characters, a ghost in the mirror, graveyard musicians, pictures, but they all feel like classic ghost tropes that just happen to be used by both the ride and this book. But it is a decent tonal adaptation of the mansion, embracing spookiness and a little bit of silliness, and I can imagine that a young person might have an interest in horror awakened by this book the exact same way they'd have it awakened by the ride. If you like children's horror, it's worth a read, just don't expect that much mansion specificity from this book. Then in 1998, we get three adaptations that feature the Mickey Mouse Gang. On July 24th, there was a Game Boy game in Japan only called Tokyo Disneyland Fantasy tour, and it had mini games based on several attractions, including one where Goofy enters the mansion. Alright, Goofy's going to the Haunted Mansion, and I don't read Japanese, I can't read this exposition. I assume that's saying there's 999 happy haunts, but there's room for a thousand, but beyond that, I don't know what's being conveyed to me here. Okay, game starts, and hey, Leota let her hair down. She looks good. She's giving us more exposition that I can't read. Okay, what am I supposed to do here? Do I 
Do I literally just choose the same design she shows me? It can't be that simple, right? Let me try a different design. Okay, that was wrong, and let me try the same design again. Wow, it's not even a memory game, it's just a matching game on the level of a Celebrity Jeopardy question on SNL. That's disappointing for a mansion minigame. But that's a nice rendering of Leota. Much better than either of the books that came with records. More prominently in 1998, we got another sing-along video, this one more focused on the mansion... Sort of. This one came out after I outgrew sing-along songs, so I never really watched it until researching this video, and... This is the one that's breaking me. So this is allegedly a Halloween party at the Haunted Mansion, and we open with our invitation to the party, and then we get Corey Burton. Sure, makes sense, right? Corey Burton. He's the go-to Paul Free sound alike, so why wouldn't he play the ghost host? Here's the thing. He's not playing the ghost host. He's playing the magic mirror. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait, wasn't Tony J the standard voice of the magic mirror at this point in Disney history? Corey's not playing the normal magic mirror. He's playing the weird live action Hans Conried magic mirror. <laughs> to the haunted mansion you're invited for a Halloween party. I'm so excited! So for those who don't know, in a number of Disney television specials, most notably One Hour in Wonderland, Hans Conried, Captain Hook himself, played a weird live-action version of the Magic Mirror who could interact with Walt and his guests and cause Charlie McCarthy to be skeptical. I am here, master. Hey, it's some kind of gag. Oh, Charlie, you shouldn't throw stones when I can see Bergen's lips moving. No wonder Disney started hiring the other ventriloquist instead. So, okay. Despite being the go-to substitute ghost host, in this video, Corey Burton's not doing Freeze, he's doing Conried. Just doing Snidely Whiplash instead of Boris Badenov. He's not doing the Hans Conried character who showed up in the mansion in the other sing-along, just the Hans Conried character that most people have no memory of Hans Conried playing, as a callback to some Walt-era television specials. But like, I really don't remember those specials being in heavy circulation in 1998. Maybe Disney Channel re-ran them from time to time, but this was not a prominent and particularly remembered version of the Magic Mirror, at least not among the target audience for a sing-along songs video. Now, Conrad's Magic Mirror does have a Haunted Mansion connection, in that reportedly the footage they shot of him in One Hour in Wonderland was the first footage they tested the mansion's face projection effects with, but I'm gonna venture a guess that very few of the people who watched this sing-along video knew that? Having Corey do Conried as a throwback to specials that the target audience doesn't remember is a deliberate choice to do some real deep Disney fan service. Not mansion fan service, but maybe we'll get more of that as we go? Come on, come on, come on, join in. The Halloween party's about to be Or maybe not, since as soon as the kids enter the mansion, this is no longer a party at Disneyland, but a party at a soundstage that makes zero effort to resemble the mansion as we know it. Did the makers of this video know anything about the Haunted Mansion? The Haunted Mansion's a Haunted Oh, I stand corrected. They're clearly experts. Send up, you crabbins and ghouls, dress up and have fun, and those are the rules. You can trick or treat with a skeleton, make no bones about it, it's fun. Like, you could argue it's supposed to be the ballroom, but the color scheme makes it look like just a different random set. Why pretend this is the Haunted Mansion? Daisy Duck said, he, 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 Minnie, I'll go as you, and you go as me. Minnie said, no, here's what we'll do. You go as me, and I'll go as you. <laughs> Daisy and Minnie are apparently going as each other. I did not get that from their costumes at all. But it is a cute couple's costume idea. Oh, yeah, uh, Minnie and Daisy are a couple. You didn't know that? Mickey and Minnie and Donald and Daisy are actually one big polycule. They have uh, other branching relationships outside of the polycule, too. Mickey is actually married to Bugs Bunny. Come on, skydiving is not a first aid activity. And that tangent had about as much to do with the Haunted Mansion as the rest of the sing-along video. Welcome to each and every guest. I am the voice that knows what's best. Hey, who said that? Oh yeah, one of those kids is a young Tyler Hecklin, long before he would go on to fame in projects like Teen Wolf, Supergirl, and Palm Springs. 
That movie had us believing someone who was in this could land both Kristen Milioti and Camila Mendez. Of course me! I'll be your guide. I'll always be at your side. Where are you? Yeah. Who are you? Yeah. Who and where and what I am is for you to guess, my little sad. So Corey, as Hans is the mirror, starts barking orders, and the kids in the video wonder who the voice is, even though the kids in the audience already know. Up the stairs and down the hall, try to find the crystal ball. Mom, crystal ball? Oh, wait, Mom, <laughs> so they find the crystal ball, which contains no Leota, but does feature a kitty song about pumpkins. Yeah, it's still better than some of the illustrations of Leota, I guess. Oh, finally, a Haunted Mansion song in this Haunted Mansion video. No Haunted Mansion footage, of course, just old Disney cartoons, including another use for Lonesome Ghosts. I guess it's kind of an eerie rendition with inexplicably changed lyrics here and there, but the last time this appeared in a sing-along, you had Thurl doing it, and this does not outdo that at all. Anyway, we're less than 10 minutes in, and that's basically all the stuff that has to do with the Haunted Mansion in this video set at the Haunted Mansion. This thing is called Party at Disneyland, and the only other scene at Disneyland is in the land that hadn't opened yet when they did their other Disneyland sing-along, so sure, they gotta promote that Toontown, but no mansion characters, just Merlin. The night's magic is not yet done. I have been commanded by my lord Mickey to transport you to the party. Let Haunted Merlin doesn't have the same ring. So, like I said, I didn't grow up with this video. I can't gauge its effectiveness as a spooky sing-along video for children. But as a Haunted Mansion adaptation... Yeah, this is the worst one yet. At least the Game Boy game had a good picture of Leota. At least this book had stories that feel at home in the Haunted Mansion, even if they're not with mansion-specific characters. The only things this sing-along has that you'd want from a mansion adaptation are the exterior at the beginning and the song. And the song is downplayed compared to other songs. But this video has what you want from a One Hour in Wonderland follow-up, so if you're in the Venn diagram of people who loved One Hour in Wonderland and were still watching Disney sing-along songs videos in 1998, I'm glad this is here for you. Fortunately, 1998's other offering is a lot more mansion-y. A little golden coloring book called either The Haunted Mansion or The Haunted Mansion Haunted Happenings, depending on if you're reading the cover or the title page. This is another one that I haven't found in print, but a scan of the entire book is available on archive.org for you to print out in color. Halloween morning started off like any other day. Mickey was walking into his office when he got a phone call. Why is the sign on the window facing in the office? Seems like a misguided way to advertise the business. Hello, squeaky cleaners, said Mickey. Yes, we've cleaned big houses before. We'll be right over. Wow, an immediate appointment. You just have no bookings. You really should have your sign facing outside, Mickey. Minnie, get the troops together. Mickey declared. We've got a big job. Yeah, that's great, Mickey. Do you mind? I'm trying to play free sale here. The squeaky cleaners had no idea what awaited them inside the house. They were going to have the scariest Halloween ever. This is one of the very few adaptations to use the Florida slash Tokyo mansion design, other than the video games that are specifically set in Tokyo. While everyone was unpacking the truck, Donald and Goofy took a look around the front yard. These big rocks have poems written on them, Goofy told Donald. Yeah, and just wait until the overflow queue has interactive gags that get boring way faster than you'd expect. What are you boys doing? Mickey asked Donald and Goofy. I want you to meet Mr. Cool. This is his house. That is clearly Lurch. You don't own the place, you're just the butler and you're pretending while the master's away. Donald notes that the house kind of reminds him of the Disney World Haunted Mansion. Wait, the Haunted Mansion attraction exists separately from this real Haunted Mansion that looks exactly like it? That is overly complicated lore for a coloring book. Then Donald asks Mickey if he's ever gotten the feeling that he's being watched. Oh, it wasn't enough to dress up as universal characters in the Mouse Factory. Now you're cribbing Looney Tunes gags. Whoa! Exclaimed Minnie. I wonder whatever happened to this member of Mr. Cool's family. Okay, you've all ridden the Haunted Mansion. Why do you not recognize the stretching portrait? It's not just similar, it's the same piece of art. 
Is that just a more common painting in this world? Is it like dogs playing poker to you? Meanwhile, Donald and Goofy were busy in the library. They didn't know they were getting help from some strangers. Since they're in the library, I assume those are supposed to be the watchful bus, which I guess in this mansion are busts of Lumiere and Cogsworth. As Donald polished a mirror, he thought he spotted someone. Wait, but the statue is literally right behind you. This isn't a Jake McKeith situation. If you turn around, you'll actually see that statue. What is going on here? Anyway, for a while, Mickey and Minnie are oblivious to the hauntings while everyone else starts to get scared. Classic Abbott and Costello stuff with some mansion iconography. Donald and Goofy ran right past Minnie and Daisy. The girls were having a chat with Mr. Ghoul's wife, Madam Leota. Whoa, bombshell! Leota's married to Mr. Ghoul? Leota Blackheart Ghoul, mansion housewife. Also, this art of Leota is clearly Madam Medusa. They cannot decide which evil Disney madam she is. Tap the tambourine and see what happens. Cackled Madam Leota. With a prompt like that, it would be more concerning if this wasn't a prank. As Minnie tapped, the table rose into the air, and a ghostly figure flew over Daisy's head. When Minnie and Daisy saw this, they decided to catch up with Donald and Goofy. So that's how the tambourine awakens the spirits. It's just living in there, I guess. So eventually even Mickey can't ignore the ghosts and everyone's scared. And they end up going through the rest of the scenes pretty much in order as they show up in the ride. Much like Ron Howard and Robbie Lester did decades before. They annoy the beating heart bride and make a break out the window. Oh, Ron and Robbie got stairs. Donald's not so lucky. When the squeaky cleaners reached the ground, they finally felt safe until they noticed they were being watched. Look, there's Archimedes again. He's just all over these mansion books. And he wasn't in the sing-along that Merlin was in. Did they have a bad breakup after Sword in the Stone? Mickey and the gang ran as fast as they could. When they passed a man and his dog, they all screamed and shivered. What's the matter with all of you? The man called after them. You look as if you've seen a ghost. Huh, this groundskeeper is less scared and more confused. That's a different take. He must be new on the job. Mickey and Minnie darted ahead of the group and came upon a tea party. Who would you like to join us? Asked one of the party hosts. Um, thank you, but we've got to run, said Mickey. And that's just what he and Minnie did. Okay, but none of these ghosts have been threatening or even unfriendly in any way. Mickey and the gang are just straight up prejudiced against ghosts. As the squeaky cleaners were driving off, Mr. Ghoul came running out of the house. Come back, Mickey cried Mr. Ghoul. You forgot all your cleaning supplies. That's okay, shouted Mickey. You can use them to clean your own mansion next Halloween. Aside from the confusing acknowledgement that the ride exists in the world of the story, this is a cute coloring book. It probably could have just been a coloring book of scenes from the mansion without the Mickey and Friends story, but you know, the story's cute enough for a little golden book. And I do like the rendition of mansion characters in the Disney house style. But I don't buy that Leota and Mr. Ghoul are married. That ship is not canon as far as I'm concerned. Then on March 23, 2000, we got another video game, Walt Disney World Quest Magical Racing Tour. Welcome to Walt Disney World. And you thought the Disney Park attractions of today had way too long names. I was aware of this game when it came out, but I didn't play it at the time because, you know, we didn't own consoles and I guess the PC version was a little too expensive considering how interested I was, but it made sense to me to turn theme park attractions into racetracks because theme park attractions loop, you know? Once someone unloads, then the next guest loads, and it made sense to just have a Mario Kart clone go through Disney World attractions. And boy howdy is this a Mario Kart clone. So yeah, never played it myself until working on this video where I am playing an emulation of the PlayStation version on my MacBook, which is probably not the ideal gameplay experience, but what do you want from me? I'm not a gaming channel. At least not for games made after 1999. The central characters of this game are Jiminy Cricket and Chip and Dale in their Rescue Rangers garb. Well, Chip and Dale aren't nearly as scared of the mansion here as they are in a day at Disneyland, which I looked at for this video, but ultimately decided didn't add enough narrative to count as an adaptation. There is also other playable characters who are original to the game, but they're reminiscent of existing Disney characters. Look, it's not Gizmo Duck. Look, it's not Rare Bear. Look, it's not Magicka Dispel. But that's not important. What's important is driving through the Haunted Mansion at breakneck speed. And what's important is that this is the first video game we've played today to actually use the mansion music, although good luck hearing it over the sound of the engines. 
So I raced, and I was doing okay at the start, until I ended up going the wrong way somehow, and then ended up somehow stuck behind the wrought iron mausoleum gate. I don't think that's supposed to be possible, but I found a way. Okay, yeah, I'm not good at this. At least not good at this on a keyboard. Screw the racing, I just want to do time trial mode because I just want to look at how they brought the mansion to this game. That's right, the mansion isn't designed for speeding past, it's meant for taking in. So you start outside, I like how the gates open during the countdown, you go in through the Florida Q canopy, into the foyer, and into the stretching room, which doesn't stretch while you're in it, but each lap it's a little more stretch, which is pretty clever. And they got all four paintings, even the ones that are behind you while you're racing through. That's attention to detail. Of course, you can skip the stretching room if you take the shortcut through the fireplace, which puts you right in the library. Then you go up the stairs in the direction of your choosing, but both paths reconnect in the candelabra hallway. Then you have to make a very sharp turn into the conservatory. Don't go down the endless hallway, you just can't. And then you can go around the occupant's coffin, there's bonuses around the other side, but it's faster to just go past it, past the clock, into the seance room where... Leota's ball is there, but the rendering doesn't really allow her to be there. At least not on this PlayStation emulator. Then, instead of the balcony overlooking the ballroom, the seance room leads directly into the floor of the ballroom, and you can drive through the dancers, but it doesn't hurt them or you in this game, so that's good. They're actually ghosts, you just go right through them. Then you loop around, go up the stairs to the balcony, where you can either shortcut over the balcony or take the long way around the hall. Then you drive up the stairs into the attic, where you can drive right through the Beating Heart Bride and crash out one of two windows until you land in the graveyard, where most of the characters are there, just, you know, rendered in very low-res sprites. And you make it into the Hitchhiking Ghost Mausoleum, where you hear a staticky soundbite of Paul Freeze telling you to beware. Well, when the cat goes crazy. And you see the ghost, which looks straight out of a 1996 GeoCities fan page. You can even see the Hitchhiking Ghost mirrors, although they don't actually reflect anything. I guess that effect was harder to do on a PlayStation than it was on an NES. Then you can just barely make out Little Leota above you, and you're back in the woods, back at the start of the track. The graphics are what they are, but considering how fast you're supposed to zip past all this, it's amazing they put in as much detail as they did. Like, it's all here, proportioned a little differently, but still, I don't think they skipped a single detail that was at Florida's mansion at the time. All in all, not a bad use of the mansion. It fits the needs of a ride track layout pretty well. Also, love the vehicles. They actually turned the Doom Buggies into a Dune Buggy. Just no notes, perfect. Also, toward the end of the year, on December 7th, a Game Boy Color version of the game came out. My understanding is all the other ports of the game are pretty similar to each other, but of course the Game Boy Color is an entirely different console with far more limited capabilities, so how do you port a racing game to that? <laughs> Not particularly well, it looks like. I guess I recognize some mansion-y architecture, but... Come on, putting the ballroom before the library? What are you doing, Game Boy Port team? Anyway, a little while later, Disney spun off Mickey Mouse Works into House of Mouse, giving the cartoons a nightclub framing device with cameos from all sorts of Disney characters, and yes, the mansion characters are included. As far as I've discovered, there were two particularly prominent uses of mansion ghosts in House of Mouse. The first was in the direct-to-video spin-off movie, Mickey's House of Villains. Like any House of Mouse episode, it's filled with archive shorts, including the Mickey Mouse work segments Mickey's Mechanical House, How to Haunt a House, Dance of the Goofies, and Hansel and Gretel, and also three classic Disney shorts, Donald and the Gorilla, and the same two that the Mouse Factory episode used, Trick or Treat and Lonesome Ghosts. I guess they figured it was easier to pad a TV episode out to a featurette length with more shorts than with more scenes. Maybe they were like, this way we could just trim some shorts and slide it in with regular House of Mouse reruns? I don't know. Welcome! Welcome, my children! <laughs> oh boy, I love Halloween! Lots of haunted happenings around town! No, that was four years ago. I've got a trick for Mickey Mouse, but you'll all have to wait until midnight. <laughs> This movie was advertised as being the big shakeup. The villains are taking over the House of Mouse. Oh no. That is teased at the beginning, but it doesn't actually happen until 45 minutes into this 68 minute video. Six of the eight shorts featured in this episode play before the plot actually starts. There's less than 20 minutes of actual plot in this over an hour long special, but in those handful of minutes, the villains take over, including Cruella releasing the hitchhiking ghost from a crate, and other familiar mansion ghosts also show up. 
Some of them even get a line in the song. It's the fact you can't ignore! It's a shorter line than the racist Lady and the Tramp Cats get, but hey. The next year, on October 10, 2003, another Halloween episode aired called House Ghosts. This episode starts with... Welcome! Welcome, my children! <laughs> the same Mickey monologue sequence that House of Villains started with. <laughs> oh boy, I love Halloween! Lots of haunted happenings around town. Five years ago now, Mickey. But one thing is added to the end of the monologue, a doom buggy. That wasn't in House of Villains. More mansion iconography, let's do it. Also, two of the Mickey Mouse work shorts in this episode are two of the same that House of Villains used, the same Hansel and Gretel Silly Symphony, and the same goofy How to Haunt a House cartoon. But that's where seeing the same footage we saw in House of Villains ends. But we do get the same plot device as Pete sees the crate of hitchhiking ghosts. All right, you grim grinning ghosties. Get out there and haunt this house. So Pete unleashes them as revenge for nobody liking his costume. But it backfires on him as the ghosts harass him instead, and Mickey seems completely unbothered. <laughs> The crypt doors creak and the tombstones quake. Spooks come out for a swinging wake. They sing a swinging arrangement of Grim Grinning Ghosts arranged by House of Mouse composer Mike Tavera. Vocalize. Grim Grinning Ghosts come out to socialize. It's a fun rendition. I like it more than either of the sing-along versions, even more than the one I'm nostalgic for. And the sequence features fun cameos from other mansion ghosts, including the executioner, not being a doorman, and the beating heart bride, catching Pete's eye before scaring him crapless. There's also more Disney animated spooks, including the skeleton dance skeletons, and yes, the lonesome ghosts, who seem really delighted at seeing Pete naked. Anyway, despite Mickey being unbothered, the happy haunts somehow prevent the costume contest from happening. But, but we didn't have the costume contest, Donald! Didn't you see the ghosts? Wow, we'll have to have the costume contest next year. I would have loved to see more mansionery throughout the episode, but this musical number captures the playful spirit of the Grim Grinning Ghost pretty well. It doesn't quite capture the scary side of the mansion for anything more than a laugh, but you know, it's a kid show for Saturday morning. If you're going to use the mansion characters in a family-friendly Saturday morning show, this is a pretty good use of them. Then, six days later, on October 16th, the first video game dedicated entirely to the mansion came out. This was part of the promotional push for the movie, even though the game only has slight connections to the movie, the biggest connections are the design of the mansion and the use of the same Dapper Dan rendition of Grim Grinning Ghosts. While the game takes its aesthetics from the then upcoming movie, the story is completely different. It's set in the past, the mansion is under a different curse, and Leota is neither Audley nor Tilly, she's... Oh, I, child, am Madame Leota, speaker of the spirit world, medium of the mysterious, and seeker of things unseen. <laughs> the Southern Belle. With that voice, I feel like her name should be Blanche. You play as Ezekiel Holloway, not to be confused with the Ezekiel in this book. The game's Ezekiel seems to be a variant on the groundskeeper, a young, lanky, awkwardly jumping version of the groundskeeper. He is summoned to the mansion by a job prospect, but it turns out Leota summoned him to help with the curse as she dumps just the most exposition in the world on him. This house was once home to many friendly ghosts, but a powerful, evil man named Atticus Thorne has taken over the estate, corrupting the memories of many of the ghosts. An ancient artifact will aid us in this effort, a sacred lantern. No, he'll be creating magical barriers throughout the mansion and twisting the very rooms themselves until we can turn on the lights and undo his spells. As the good power of these souls increases in the beacon, their energy will enable us to break down the magical barriers that Thorn has erected. But there is more I have to tell. <clears throat> The primary source of the beacon's power lies in the six sacred gems that adorn it. They, I'm sorry if you find this confusing, Zeke, but I'm afraid we have little time and much to do. Still, Zeke seems to be taking it pretty well. Leota comes with you, essentially playing the role of a slightly more helpful Navi from Ocarina of Time, and also dumping more exposition. And much like in the movie, the real chills come not from the ghosts, but from the spiders. I certainly appreciate that the familiar mansion ghosts are not your enemies, but rather the ones you need to rescue. Something's missing. 
Can we get more cowbell? Uh, yeah, shouldn't you be demolishing Country Bear Hall? And I appreciate the way the game attempts to marry aesthetics from the movie with aesthetics from the ride even if it's more of a switching back and forth between them than an actual organic blend. And I appreciate the Doom Buggy Easter egg, despite there being no narrative justification for it. There's a lot I appreciate in this game, but I did not enjoy playing it. It wasn't frustrating in the way some of the earlier games were frustrating, where I just kept failing. It was just tedious, repetitive quests over and over and over, and I was just aching for bigger variety in gameplay. I appreciate how much this game tries to do justice to the feel of the mansion and expand the world of the mansion, but it's not fun to play. But if you gave the same plot to a point-and-click adventure in the Haunted Mansion, I'd be interested in that. Anyway, on November 26, 2003, just in time for Thanksgiving and nearly a full month late for Halloween, we got the first theatrical Haunted Mansion movie. Yep, this is the adaptation that looms largest until the new movie comes out, and it's generally seen as a disappointment, even by its star. I did a Haunted Mansion movie, and it didn't. It wasn't very good. <laughs> so I don't know if they want to bring the old baggage and have me <laughs> stinking up the new one. On paper, there's a lot that must have made sense in development. Don Hahn had good experiences before producing a movie about a curse that befell all the servants of a house that could only be broken by the master's true love. And Comedians in Haunted Houses is a tried and true formula. Sort of, it was a, a paradigm from Bob Hope and the Ghost Breakers, and it was Don Knotts and the Ghost of Mr. Chicken and Abner and Costello meet Frankenstein. And that, those are the sort of movies where you have an ordinary, everyday show going into a haunted circumstance and just trying to get out of it any way he could. And sort of putting Eddie Murphy into that role was sort of a perfect modern, everyday uh, equivalent of those guys. At one point, they were going to honor the legacy of comedians in haunted houses so much that they were going to cast Mr. Chicken himself, Don Knotts, in this movie. Don Knotts was going to play the groundskeeper. That is the most perfect casting ever, and not just because having two separate Mayberry alum and two separate mansion adaptations would make me personally very happy. But for whatever reason, the character's not there. I don't know if Don Knotts dropped out or if just rewrites wrote him out before he even filmed, but there's no groundskeeper in the movie. Well, no living groundskeeper. There's the ghost of the groundskeeper, which seems like really missing the mark, having the one living character in the ride be just another ghost in the pile of ghosts. Look at the size of these knockers. Have you seen anything like that before? Perfect metaphor for the movie as a whole, really. Referencing a joke in an actual horror comedy without keeping the actual joke. Knockers was obviously from Young Frankenstein. Um... <laughs> Uh, anything we can take from that movie, we will. Remember this fun, silly, scary thing? Here's a watered-down piece with its aftertaste. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what went wrong here, but I don't think it's just one thing. I think it's a death by a thousand little cuts. There were some bigger miscalculations than others. You can chalk it up to family-friendly remake era Eddie Murphy is a terrible choice to lead the Haunted Mansion movie, but honestly, Eddie Murphy as a realtor trying to sell the Haunted Mansion is an even funnier idea than Phyllis Diller as the ghost host or Gilbert Gottfried in the Tower of Terror. That element would have been a great framing device for like a comedic Halloween TV special. Eddie Murphy is the realtor trying to put a positive spin on the mansion's features and that's the framing device for, like, the history of the mansion or classic spooky Disney cartoons. We don't have enough excuses to show lonesome ghosts yet. It's just not a good fit for THE Haunted Mansion movie. But that said, the movie's problems do go a little deeper. It wouldn't be fixed just by recasting the lead role. What is it? It's so, like, the son has this arc about overcoming his fears, where he's got a fear of spiders, and then he needs to face that fear of spiders. All your life you're gonna be facing spiders, okay? I am. What I'm trying to say is you should never be afraid. Don't be afraid of anything. I get why having an arc related to fears made sense for a Haunted Mansion movie, but I really don't think overcoming those fears is the story that the Haunted Mansion is telling you. I think accepting and learning to live with your fears would be a much better mansion moral. And the dialogue pays lip service to that idea. It's okay to get scared, alright? Everybody gets scared sometimes. It's okay to get scared. Everybody gets scared every now and then, son, but you just can't let it stop. But in practicality, the action is still about mustering up bravery in the face of the fear and not just accepting fear as a part of life, which I feel like is much closer to the story the attraction wants to tell you. But at least the sun's arc, even if it ends up at the wrong place for a mansion movie, is still kind of on theme for a mansion movie. Eddie's arc is... 
He's late coming home on his own anniversary because he's working on the business he shares with his wife. So, you know, a simple phone call would have taken care of everything. But instead, he makes up for it by taking the family to the lake. And then he learns not to take even small detours. Like, he learns that doing any work for the business is bad, I guess. And he learns to keep trying, I guess. I tried. I failed. Try again. Okay, he learns that the only thing that breaks haunted glass is a car, for some reason. I get that it's, you know, metaphor for putting his family ahead of his belongings, but that wasn't even, like, a big character flaw of his. It was just, like, a little moment early on. Hey, Megan, don't slam the door like that. It's very sensitive. It's a car, Dad. Ah! It's not just a car. A very delicate piece of machinery. And it's such a minuscule thread of this thing that doesn't tie into the themes relevant to the mansion's story. Unless it's going for a theme of, like, letting go of earthly possessions, but it doesn't tie that super well when even the ghosts don't let go of earthly possessions. You can't take it with you. The hell I can't! <laughs> But then at the same time, there are some faithful representations of sequences from the attraction. Eddie finds most of them behind a stereotypical secret passage. There's always a sliding bookcase, you know, a trap door, a secret, a secret passage. I think it's just an homage to every, you know, haunted house movie that's been made ever. <laughs> Perfect metaphor for the movie as a whole, really. The good Haunted Mansion stuff is hidden away in there. You just got to look for it behind the bland cliche movie. The butler did it? You gotta be kidding me. And don't get me wrong, the ride is not above using horror tropes and cliches as well. But at least it presents the novelty of seeing them happen right in front of your face. Seeing cliches that aren't from the ride happen in the movie just makes me wonder, why am I watching this movie instead of the hundreds of others I've seen this scene in? This scene actually was not uh, shot in the original photography. It was something that we added after we had cut the movie together. We realized that somehow Eddie was missing through part of the movie. So we uh, surprisingly created this set, which was really the closest homage we paid to the ride. It's very much out of the ride at Disneyland. Uh, and it wasn't really there in the original conception of the movie. So it's there because they needed scenes with Eddie Murphy, but they didn't come up organically in the story. Both Eddie Murphy and the iconography of the Haunted Mansion are largely superfluous in the Haunted Mansion movie. So when your most faithful translation of attraction scene to movie scene is only there because they realized the plot didn't give their alleged main character anything to do, that's a sign that your movie's problems go deeper than just it's not doing enough from the ride. A better execution of the Mansion fan service might have made more Mansion nerds enjoy the film, but that alone wouldn't have made it resonate with a wider audience. The success of the first Pirates movie eclipsed the popularity of the source material in popular culture. Yes, it happened to be a good Pirates adaptation, but it was also just a fun movie people liked even if they had never heard of the ride. And I don't know what could have been changed to make this movie appeal to a wider audience because nobody knows anything, but there were real easy ways to make this appeal more to Mansion fans at the very least. Like, leaving the mansion haunted at the end for one. Bye -bye. That feels like a change that was made in effort to appeal to a wider audience, but it didn't really work. Some of the fan service is effective, and some just comes so close but doesn't quite get there. The storm has flooded the road. I'm afraid there will be no leaving the mansion tonight. I'm afraid there's no other way. Just say there's no turning back now. You're dancing around it. Just say it. Even after the misguided ending, the movie ends with botched fan service by having Leota and the bus in the car because it's not like there are any prominent characters in the mansion specifically associated with hitchhiking you could have used here. We don't know for a fact that the hitchhiking ghosts were part of the ghosts who went to heaven. They could still be around. If the bus are still around, who knows? But at least the fan service in the post credit scene mostly works. Hurry back, be sure to bring your death certificate. If you decide to join us, make your final arrangements now. We've been dying 
have you. <laughs> yeah, that line read worked. Tilly is a much better fit for little Leota than for Madame Leota. One of the many things that worked about the first Pirates movie is that the fan service was actually woven organically into the story. Every recreation of a ride tableau happens for about a second in a scene that the story set up anyway. Main characters in jail? Throw in the dog scene. A character's drunk? Have him sleeping with the pigs. But here... The scenes from the ride are detours that distract from the goal. Look, it's the singing busts! Only four of them, and none with Thurl's voice, even though I don't think Thurl was retired at this point. It would have been a great vocal cameo. They put in his face, but not his voice, and that just seems wrong. But it's Dapper Dan's. You like them. They're a Disneyland thing. Oh, in Dixie. Dad, there oh, it is. Thank you. Okay, never mind the plots over here. That was just a distraction. The biggest fan service sequence in the entire movie is just kind of breezed through. It's going to take up probably about two minutes in the film. It's one continuous shot, even though we're shooting it over many days. All that work, all that effort, all that care and love and respect for the iconography of the ride, just kind of there. The artistry behind the technology really gives us the ability to take original ideas from the ride, anywhere from Madame Leota to the ghosts flying up around, to stars in the sky, and really take that to another level where it feels three-dimensional. You know what else feels three-dimensional? Riding the ride. The only characters from the ride who are actually part of the story and not just mild distractions are Madame Leota and Master Gracie, who's not really so much a character from the ride as it is a name from the queue. Keep in mind that uh, the original plan was that Master Gracie was supposed to be a dead child, not the master of the house. I am Madame Leota. Of all. But Madame Leota's main goal just seems to be sending them on fetch quests. Enter the tomb under the great dead oak and travel down deep under the ground. And there you will find the key that must be found. Find the black crypt that bears no name or soon your fate will be the same. Let me guess, you're gonna get to the end of the crypt and then Goofy gives you the key. But originally the hitchhiking ghosts were gonna be part of the story. They were gonna be the main ghosts who help everyone out. But then in rewrites, they just turned them into servants. So that's why Ezra, instead of being hitchhiking ghost Ezra, is now Wallace Shawn. And instead of the other two ghosts, we have his wife, Emma, who is played by the other, other actress who played Fraser's ex-wife, Nanny G. I dreamt that I was riding I'm not trying to work the Cheers universe into every single video, it just keeps coming up. The movie's also just not very funny. I mean, Eddie Murphy is a great comedic performer and he's got comedic delivery, but the words he's saying just aren't that funny. And I know that's subjective, maybe you do think it's funny and fair enough, but even if it is funny, it's just not a tonal fit for the Haunted Mansion. And like I said earlier, the humor of Phyllis Diller is not really a tonal fit for the Haunted Mansion, but at least the jokes they gave her were tonal fits, even if the delivery wasn't. Here it's just not really Haunted Mansion type jokes. It's deflating the mansion. In the ride, the humor works with the scares. The humor lowers your guard to make the scares hit harder, and then the scares lower your guard to make the humor hit harder. But they work together. Even when the jokes are about the mansion and its peculiarities, the target of the joke is you, the living, and your discomfort with it. The jokes are made by the comfortable because of their amusement with those who are uncomfortable. Here, Maybe Jim Evers is using humor as a defense mechanism against his fear, and that's not inherently bad, but it is not the mansion's sense of humor. The jokes here all come from the uncomfortable, making fun of the mansion to try to assuage their discomfort, not from the comfortable, amused by the discomfort. Neither approach to humor is inherently better or worse than the other, they just aren't the same styles of humor, so if your goal is to adapt the haunted mansion, it helps to understand the mansion's sense of humor. In fact, the very best joke in this movie is just in the director's commentary. This is uh, Jennifer Tilly's head. Um, I actually got to work with Jennifer Tilly's voice on Stuart Little and graduated to her head on this picture. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to work with her whole body uh, soon. I also hate to ask questions like this in movies with fantastical elements, but... I do not understand the rules here. I don't make the rules, okay? I just work here. So Leota is the only one who knows things, but she doesn't control anything. She is part of a separate haunted magic than the ghost magic, but she didn't put the curse on the house. That's just unseen forces. But she does know about the curse and she has answers about the curse. But she doesn't know everything because she can't just 
break the curse herself. She has to just talk in riddles, I guess. And Ramsley, for some reason, thinks that his plan will break the curse that he's definitely responsible for, but he's really convinced that continuing to do things his way is also the solution to the mess that he got himself in. I mean, okay, that's just the character flaw of Ego, I guess, but he thinks he's got a grasp on these rules that the audience definitely does not have a grasp on. Well, damn you. Damn you, Lord. So then Ramsley summons the Hell Demons, but they turn out to be his own undoing, just like Pete unleashing the hitchhiking ghosts, and once again, Eddie is superfluous in his own movie, but what was he trying to do there, and why did he think it would work? So the singing bus are also haunted by a different magic than the rest of the house, because they also didn't go to heaven, and that's fine, but, like, why have most of the ghosts under one particular curse, but then there's just also additional haunted stuff that is never explained even as little as the original curse is explained, and if the story was more compelling, I wouldn't mind the vagueness behind the rules. I don't know the rules in the mansion itself, I just know there's ghosts, and they like being here, and I don't need to know the rules, but you're presenting just a few too many rules for me to be comfortable not knowing the rest of them. Part of the magic of the original ride is that the disparate flavors from different artists all come together and blend into a tone all of its own. The spookiness of Claude Coates and the goofiness of Mark Davis aren't intrinsically compatible, but they work together to craft the mansion's own distinct identity. And unfortunately, the disparate flavors that went into this movie do not blend nearly as seamlessly. This film was made by talented people, and it's clear that Rick Baker especially really wanted to do the mansion justice. He cast himself as the hatchet man. I wanted to stay true to the feeling of the ride because I'm a big fan of the ride. This is very much the drawing that Mark Davis did. Give that makeup to a walk-around character at Mickey's Not So Scary and Oogie Boogie Bash. I dare you! Nobody here wanted to make a bad Haunted Mansion movie, but for whatever reason, whether it was misguided creative decisions or just mandates from corporate, the story they settled on did not do the mansion justice. But hey, it still gives me more of what I want from the mansion than that stupid sing-along, so that's the bar we're clearing here. Ultimately, it's a meshing of disparate ideas that all make sense separately and might even make sense on paper together, but they just don't quite congeal. There is a lot to like in it, but despite being the most prominent adaptation thus far, it certainly isn't worthy of being the definitive Haunted Mansion adaptation. That said, there are people younger than me who grew up with this movie and loved it. It was one of their first exposures to horror comedy, and it got them interested in the spooky and the silly the exact same way the ride would for people their age. So I guess for kids, it can be an effective companion to the ride. There still could have been much better ways to implement this ride to a film, and I hope we're about to see one, but if this movie worked for you as a kid, I'm happy for you. There is also a bunch of stuff to promote the movie. There was a DVD feature that claims to be a virtual ride, but it's really just a tour of the movie sets with new footage of Ezra and Emma. Neat DVD feature, it's nice that they got more Wallace Shawn for this, but it's pretty far removed from the ride, especially when the title makes it sound like it's going to be a virtual ride through of the original mansion. There are also two music videos connected to this movie. The one on the DVD is for the song that's not in the movie, Raven Simone's cover of Stevie Wonder's Superstition. A cover which samples just a little bit of Grim Grinning Ghosts. In this music video, Raven and her friends are green screened into the exterior of the movie's mansion for a surprise party. They dance on the sets of the movie and are apparently scared by fog, I guess? Okay, all right, y'all, no more surprise parties. Uh -uh. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. Uh -uh. Then there's the Nelly video, the song that is in the credits of the movie, even though it wasn't written for the movie, Is You, which samples the People's Court theme. Yep. Nelly is green screened into the exterior of the mansion because he inherited it from his uncle. They go inside and it's neither the interiors from the movie nor the ride, but it's still haunted in ways that have nothing to do with the movie or the ride. So the cover song that's not in the movie uses the sets from the movie, and the song that wasn't written for the movie but is in the credits has a video based on the movie that doesn't use the sets from the movie and is not included on the DVD. Good, I wasn't confused enough yet. 
And we're not quite done with the movie continuity yet, because it continued in comics in Disney Adventures magazine. The December 2003 issue plugged the Mansion movie hard, featuring an interview with the kids from the movie, a closer look at a few of the ghosts, and a comic. Scans of the comic can be found on the Mansion fandom wiki, but I bought a copy off eBay myself to see if there was anything interesting in the BTS info. There wasn't really, but um, it is very funny that the cover places the Mansion movie side by side with a slightly smaller showcase of a movie that would go on to win 11 Oscars. And it's funny that ordering this on eBay cost me a spooky $13.13! .13. The comic in this issue is called Cookie Creeps, about young twins named Ty and Madison selling cookies for a school trip. And Madison wants to sell cookies at Gracie Manor, even though Ty's too scared. Well, until he sees the suits of armor and can quote Holy Grail, and then he just barely avoids getting hit by a knight. Ezra and Emma find the kids, and then a scary ghost starts chasing them. The ghosts chase Madison into the secret passageway, while Emma and Ezra escort Ty outside. Madison skips the fan service hallway and goes straight to Jennifer Tilly, who doesn't really contribute much because Emma and Ezra immediately usher Madison outside again, just in the nick of time as the scary ghost shows up. Meanwhile, Ty's outside and runs into the singing bus, who are just as unhelpful as they are in the movie. But at least Ty got over his fears long enough to befriend the singing bus while Madison is filled with new fears. And they escape the mansion with Madison vowing never to sell cookies again. Much to the scary ghost chagrin. He just wanted a cookie! Wah, 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 wah. Trespassers don't get cookies! Then there was another mansion comic in the winter 2004 Comic Zone issue of Disney Adventures called Monster Makeover. Unfortunately, the Mansion Fandom Wiki only has scans of two pages of the comic, and it considers the rest to be lost media. Fortunately, eBay still exists. Yeah, I scanned it. Links in the description. The crew of Space Extreme, TV's most extreme home decorating show, arrives at Gracie Manor. A crew consisting of the host, Phil, the producer, Rita, and the cameraman, Larry. And his camera that he calls Tony. So I guess in this case, some jerk is the camera. The crew barges in uninvited, which annoys Ramsley, but he takes the opportunity to mess with them. Given that this was the extreme early 2000s, Phil begins redecorating by... Sledgehammering paint everywhere. And a ghost sneaks up on him, and Larry tries to warn him, but another ghost trips Larry into the paint. Later, Phil tries to get rid of the old junk in the mansion, like Madame Leota. Just trying to get rid of the old junk that's actually in the haunted mansion. Are we sure Phil didn't produce the movie? So Leota summons ghosts to mess with them, Phil doesn't take responsibility, Larry tries to escape, but Ramsley is not done torturing the crew. So he gives them a taste of the zombie mausoleum. And that's the last straw. So the crew escapes into the night, and Ramsley's satisfied until he sees that their damage is already done. They put a skateboard ramp in the ballroom! Wah, 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 wah. These comics are... cute, I guess? The artwork is decent, and the premises are fine. I just don't think the jokes in them are very funny. But it is interesting that they try to blend the ride sense of humor with the movies, having some jokes deflate the mansion, and some deflate its intruders. The important thing about these comics, though, is that the premise of kids selling cookies in the mansion, and the premise of a home renovation show entering the mansion, are both exactly as funny as the premise of Eddie Murphy as a realtor trying to sell the mansion. Your big budget movie was built on a back phone about as strong as a Disney Adventures comic premise. Then, beginning in October 2005, we had a new comics continuity, a Haunted Mansion comic book line that was released quarterly until October 2007. These are anthology comics published by the unfortunately named Slave Labor Graphics from a number of different writers and artists. Seven issues were released and an eighth was in development but never put out but some of the stories from it have leaked online. Issue one has six stories. The first, Room for a Thousand, is another of these adaptations that basically has a character go through the scenes of the ride in order, but instead of that character being a living guest, it's a hopeful ghost who wants to move in and become the thousandth happy haunt. He himself still seems a little scared by some of the other residents, but then he scares the only living human in the story, the groundskeeper, and then he feels confident and at home in the mansion. 
but we, the living, are reminded that they still have room for another. This is just about perfect. It's nearly all the scenes you like in the ride, with only a few omissions, but those get covered in other stories in this issue. But it doesn't focus on boring humans taking up space. It's the first demonstration that a Haunted Mansion story could just be about the ghosts. It faithfully adapts the ride as we know it, while reminding us of the potential of this series. There's 999 happy haunts here, and there's room to hear all of their stories. The second story, Blueprint for Murder, is about the building of the mansion, and only features three characters, all of whom are named after Imagineers. Mr. Gracie hires Mr. Coates and Mr. Davis to build the mansion for him. And as a probable nod to Claude and Mark's differing ideologies in building the mansion, Mr. Coates and Davis do not get along. And Coates plans Davis's murder, not knowing that Davis was planning the same thing for Coates. So this is revealed to be the backstory for the coffin occupant and the candelabra down the hallway. I like tying those two haunts together since they're so near each other in the ride. And yeah, as far as potential backstories for elements of the mansion go, this one works for me. The third, while the Fifi is away, focuses on ghosts we don't get a lot of stories about, the ghosts in the pet cemetery. It's about a poodle who thinks her owner, the beating heart bride, misses her more than she actually does. Husband, I gaze nightly in search of you, yet I know you will never return to me. Why does my heart still beat for you so? And why does that little rat dog keep staring at me? It's pretty funny, and it adds some lore that outside ghosts can't go in the mansion and inside ghosts can't come out. The fourth story, Talking Heads, is about the beheaded knight coming to Madame Leota who doesn't realize she's dead. A spirit from beyond. How marvelous. My powers must be improving. I didn't even go into a trance, and yet here you are. But Madame Leota, you yourself are... Ah! Just go with it. She's been dead for who knows how long. But I'll be darned if I can convince her of it. I see. I don't know how I feel about Oblivious Leota. It's a unique take, but I feel like I prefer Leota as a font of wisdom rather than her as a sort of Buzz Lightyear oblivious that she's the same as those around her. The fifth story, The New Groundskeeper, is a little story about the groundskeeper, whose name apparently is not Clyde, but is in fact Horace Fusselbottom, and he is fired from taking care of the mansion and replaced by this 80s movie bully. But Horace gives an ominous warning that they won't like a stranger there, and sure enough, when the bully arrives, the ghosts just want to know where Horace is, and they chase the bully out to the point of the hitchhiking ghost following him home. So that's a good way to work in the one bit of lore that doesn't really work if you're just following a ghost who's not leaving. It's a different interpretation of the groundskeeper role than his usual scaredy cat self. You know, the version that the first story in this issue went with. But I kind of dig that the groundskeeper and the ghosts have a cordial relationship here. That is a fun interpretation that the ghosts have their token living friend that they like. The final segment is part one of an ongoing story, and we'll get to that in a moment. But issue two begins with another story about the groundskeeper and his secret. Uncle Theodore sings why the groundskeeper continues to work this job if he's so scared all the time. Turns out, his wife is buried here, and he dines with her every night. I don't know if this shares a canon with the earlier Groundskeeper story or not, since the wife seems to be the only ghost Horace has any sort of relationship with here, but it's a sweet little story. It's interesting that this is a story about holding on to the past, when so many ghost stories are about learning to let go of life, but this is also a story about how learning to live with your fears can lead to something rewarding, and I'll take that over the movie's handling of facing fears. The next story in issue two is called Lenore Meets the Haunted Mansion, and no, it's not an origin story for the Raven. This is a crossover with SLG's original character, Lenore the Cute Little Dead Girl. I don't know anything about this character beyond her appearance in the story, which involves her going to the mansion because she's trying to sleep and she's annoyed by the noise. She moves through the mansion and riffs on various elements of it, and in this case it seems to have elements of being a real haunted mansion and elements of being a theme park attraction. She gets to the source of the noise, the 20,000 Leagues organ, and then she gets distracted and doesn't move through the rest of the mansion. Much like the movie, here Lenore's jokes are kind of deflating the mansion rather than enhancing it, but I accept that more here because it's coming from another spooky being and not some dumb mortal, and also this isn't a feature film. Still, I imagine this works better as a Lenore comic guest starring the Haunted Mansion than it does as a Haunted Mansion comic guest starring Lenore, but I don't actually know. Lenore Debotes would have to answer that for me. The next story, The Woman in Black, is about a young boy escaping the terrifying Woman in Black by hiding out in the mansion where he meets a ghost boy named Victor who takes him to Leota. There's still more stuff about Leota being confused, and that's just gonna be a running thing here, isn't it? 
but Leota does still have wisdom, and she tells him that he doesn't belong and that he needs to face his fears. So he faces the woman in black, only to discover that she's only looking for her son, Victor. So once again, we have a sweet little twist and a much better use of the facing your fears idea than Eddie's son went through. I'm not saying this entire comic series is an apology for the movie, but I'm not not saying that either. The Big Nap is the first of our stories to focus on the hitchhiking ghosts, and it's a wordless little story about Gus and the circumstances that led him to being a prisoner, and then a ghost, and then a hitchhiker. It's lighter in tone than a lot of these stories, but I feel like it would legitimately make a great animated short. The first story of issue 3 focuses not on the groundskeeper, but on his dog, who's digging up bones, much to the chagrin of the ghosts those bones belong to. But when they find out he's bringing the bones to orphan puppies, they decide they can spare them. We have had as many sweet twists in these stories as we've had creepy twists. I like that the individual stories are allowed so many different tones. Next is The Mummy's Curse, a short little backstory for the tea-drinking mummy, who was cursed with a thousand curses by Anubis, and had to pass them all on to others. And he feels he may be responsible for the curses on Gracie Manor. Of course, his companion doesn't really hear his confession. Next is The Peppermint Girl, where two boys sneak into the mansion and fall for a wallflower in the ballroom, so they each race to remove themselves from the land of the living first so they can be her dance partner. And yet, each attempt is unsuccessful. The darkly comic twist is that neither of them realize they're both dead, and they're both too wrapped up in their competition to actually dance with the Peppermint Girl. I love this, it's so sitcom-y. It's just like Frasier and Niles competing over a girl and being so focused on the competition that they don't realize that they both have a chance if they just made a move. Look, when I said I wasn't going to tie every video back to Cheers and Frasier, I lied. Issue 4 begins with the first installment of a second ongoing story. Again, we'll get to all the ongoing stories later. The second story is Big Game, about a hunter who has bagged all manner of mythical creatures, but what he wants is to hunt a ghost. So he goes to the mansion and selects his prey, and he chooses the Executioner, presumably based on his doorman abilities. But the only way he can tussle with the ghost is to become one himself. So he ingests some poison and is immediately welcomed as a mansion resident and doesn't have a chance to hunt, leaving his sidekick stuck out of luck. Then we return to the pet cemetery for Night of the Ghost Fleas, in which our dear Fifi is frustrated by fleas, and frustrated by trying to follow the logic of ghost rules, and even annoyed by the hitchhiking ghosts themselves. It's another piece where the humor comes from deflating the mansion rather than working with it. The jokes are amusing, but it's far more of a mansion parody than a mansion story proper. No wonder it's written by the same writer of the Lenore story. Still, in an anthology, it's okay if some of the pieces take a more irreverent tone with the source material. Issue 5 begins with a dynamite party, and it's the backstory of the dynamite guy from the stretching portraits. Basically, he's a real jerk to his wife, he gets an invite to a party at Gracie Manor, he goes pantsless just to spite her, and he can't see what's going on so he's oblivious to the hauntings and the spookiness, and his inability to see leads to him sealing his own fate. So it's the Lockhorns meets Mr. Magoo meets Grunkle Stan, I guess. In the next story, Blue Loop Guru, the mummy asks the werewolf why he's so sad. The werewolf explains the story of how he got trapped in the mansion, but that's not really what's making him sad. What's making him sad is that there's nothing to eat because even the fish are ghosts. Wah, wah. Then another installment of an ongoing story, and then the Pickwick Capers, the backstory for Pickwick, the chandelier ghost. Pickwick had a fear of heights instilled in him at a young age, so he became a great cat burglar by sneaking under things. A mysterious stranger at a bar challenges him to steal the pirate gold from Gracie Manor. So he manages to sneak in underneath. But it turns out it's not heights that do him in, it's depths, as he can't survive the stretching room. But he got over his fear of heights, so that's something. This feels the most, like, ironic prequel joke version of all these stories. It's like, oh yeah, that high up guy, he used to be scared of heights. It's like, things used to be the opposite of how they are now. James Bond didn't used to care whether his martinis were shaken or stirred. But, you know, it's cute. Issue 6 is, uh, mostly ongoing stories, but the one sort of standalone story in it is Doom of the Diva, the backstory for the opera lady, Baronessa Elda. Despite being an operatic talent, her career has taken a downturn due to her difficult reputation, but she gets invited to sing at Gracie Manor. She's confused when she has no audience, but when she starts singing, the ghosts start arriving. 
and this terrifies her. She tries to escape while some prankish spirits tie her hair to the balcony, but Gracie appeals to her ego. But she's scared over the balcony and her neck is broken by her own hair. Dark. But at least she sticks around to sing for everyone forever. Issue 7 begins with another wordless hitchhiking ghost story, Laugh I Thought I'd Die, featuring Ezra. Ezra apparently sells novelties and gags. But when sales start to go down, he scours the world for new gags and discovers a Chinese finger trap in this sequence that is, um, probably not the most culturally sensitive thing we've encountered here. And he's stuck in the finger trap and, uh, laughs himself to death, I think. And then he gets invited to the mansion where he annoys all the other ghosts with his gags, so he's hitchhiking for a way out. Next is On a Tight Rope, the backstory of the tightrope girl in the stretching portraits. In this continuity, her name is Daisy de la Cruz, and she tightropes over alligators as a carnival act in the bayou. She is collecting so many suitors, and it turns out she's turning them into gators. And the gators are waiting for their revenge. Then we move on to Three of a Kind about another stretching portrait, the Quicksand Guys whose names in this story are Hobbs, Big Hobbs, and Skinny Hobbs. These three are traveling gambling men, but when a certain Bartholomew Gore catches them cheating, he chases them out to the swamp. Of course, they come across quicksand, and when they can't decide how to cross it, they decide to gamble for who should carry each other. And they continue to be stuck there to this day. Issue 8 was never released, but two stories from it were leaked. The first is Preaching to the Choir, which is the backstory of the little ghosts that come out of the organ. Turns out they're a school bus full of dead children. Yeah, this one's dark, and the bus driver is the creepiest thing we've seen in these comics so far. The other is the last of the hitchhiking ghost stories, The Doctor is In, about Phineas or as he's known here, Dr. Phineas Q. Hackenbush. He was a flim-flam medicine man who sold a bunch of snake oil to a bunch of suckers, but when he's chased out of town, he falls to his death. So he's invited to the mansion, where he tries his tricks again, and ends up making the ghosts think they're sick, I think, much to Madame Leota's confusion. So she has words with him, and then he's trying to get out of there, just like the other hitchhikers. Okay, now that we've looked at all the one-off stories, it's time to look at the ongoing stories, starting back in issue one with part one of The Mystery of the Manse. The Hanging Ghost Host checks in with us after we've read the other little stories in the issue. Yes, the Ghost Host was once William Gracie, the first mate on the sailing ship Pomona. When Captain Pace is facing a dangerous storm, despite the crew's protests, Gracie discovers that Pace has been secretly gun smuggling and not sharing the profits with the crew. Gracie confronts Paste, but then the storm starts breaking the ship, and Pace is stuck tied to the ropes. Rather than free Pace, Gracie, in his anger, cuts his head off and puts his head in a hat box. Ah, see what they did there? And at the point of the story's publication, the hat box ghost was still missing in action, so this wouldn't have been like a deep, deep, deep cut, but still a deep-ish cut for this story to use. And that was how William Gracie became Captain Blood. The story continues in issue two, which is as much a Pirates of the Caribbean comic as it is a Haunted Mansion comic. From that day on, it was all yo-ho, yo-ho, a pirate's life for me. But as the age of piracy is over, Gracie plans his escape from this lifestyle, and it involves betraying his entire crew in exchange for safe passage to New Orleans. In issue three, the Pirates of the Caribbean connections come to a close as Gracie arrives at Lafitte's Landing. Gracie is told of a mansion he can retire to, which I guess means this doesn't share continuity with that earlier story where he hired Coates and Davis to build the mansion, but hey. Mystery surrounded the place. Even the men who designed and built the house had disappeared shortly after its completion. Or that story did happen, it just wasn't Gracie who hired them, I guess? Look. Again, I like that the continuity is kind of muddled between the different stories here because it makes them feel more like ghost stories that have been passed on and embellished. So Gracie becomes the latest person to kind of go through the scenes in the mansion, or at least the ones that exist at this point in the narrative. He's scared, but he's home. In part four, anime boyfriend Gracie here falls in love with Emily DeClaire. He asks Emily to marry him, but realizes he needs to exercise the house if she's going to live there. And that's when Leota enters the picture. And Leota's interested in Gracie while he's still in love with Emily. And 
I don't know, like jealous, spurned lover, love triangle Leota. I think I like even less than clueless Leota. But I guess if Gracie chooses Leota, then they'll get married, he'll change his name to Mr. Ghoul, and then they'll invite Mickey and the gang over to clean the mansion. But that doesn't happen in this continuity. Instead, Leota does her famous seance ostensibly to remove all the ghosts. But she has different ideas when she realizes that the ghosts are the crew that Gracie betrayed. So without telling Gracie, she turns the mansion into a magnet for ghosts. But as far as he's concerned, the ghosts have all gone away because he has no idea who's just been summoned to the mansion. Oh snap, Gracie versus Hatbox, it's gonna go down! In part five, we go to the day of the wedding, but Leota arrives to cause trouble because we're really sticking with jealous spurned Leota here. Emily looks in the attic for something old and finds an old hat box. But the ghost of the dead captain arrives and tells her the truth about her fiance. Would you have left him if you knew that William Gracie was once the infamous Captain Blood, Scourge of the Caribbean? Would you feel differently about him if you knew he betrayed his crew? My crew! And left them to die so he could escape with their treasure. When Gracie hears his bride-to-be screams, he races up to the attic to find her speechless on the floor as his old captain and his old crew are gathered. Poor, poor William. Seems your precious love died of a broken heart. Wow, I thought that condition only affected people from Naboo. But on the hatbox captain's way out, he reveals the truth. It was Leota who summoned him. And Gracie murders Leota mid-seance. He realizes redemption is beyond him now, so he takes the only way out. There's always his way. But then, the story continues in part 6. Leota's sudden death caused her to not even realize it had happened and to continue her seance, forever making the mansion a beacon for wayward ghosts. And we get a little explanation for why there are so many different types of ghosts, even ones that don't really fit together. The one living person still around is Michelle, the maid, who opportunistically continues to take care of the house so she can access the pirate gold. And Gracie tells us the current state of the mansion, and the listener tries to escape. As mansion backstories go, there is a lot I like in it, and then there are quite a few things that I really don't like, but overall, it's a better backstory than the movie gave the mansion. But now we move on to the other ongoing story, which is, um, two ongoing stories, or really one ongoing story that was about to set up another ongoing story, but, uh, well, you'll see. This begins at the start of issue 4 with The Interview. A young girl named Sarah is racing to the mansion for an interview to be the new housekeeper. The maid interviewing her, presumably Michelle, gives her the lay of the land. She also tells Sarah something she didn't realize. She died on her way to the mansion. But it turns out she's not fully dead yet, and she's brought back just in the nick of time. But she has mixed feelings about it. Oh man. I just blew another interview. This looked like such a nice place to live. This first part of the story kind of seems like a way to reconcile seemingly incongruous theories about the mansion, both that you yourself die when you fall out of the attic and that you escape to the land of the living and a ghost follows you home. This first installment of the story kind of has that cake and eats it too. The girl did die, but she is still going home at the end. Of course, it's not quite the end yet. In the middle of issue 5, we get the follow-up interview. Sarah can't stop thinking about how much fun the ghosts looked like they were having in Gracie Manor. Her boyfriend Steve is not very patient with this. I thought you were done with your bad goth poetry phase, Sarah. Do you have to be a jerk all the time, Steve? Do I have to be? No, it just works out that way. Sarah ultimately decides she wants to go back to Gracie Manor. In issue 6, Steve races to the mansion to try to stop her, but instead, he begins the journey through the mansion tour. Sarah arrives a little later and runs into the groundskeeper, who tells us a little more about his wife. Sarah talks about how much she wants to live with the ghosts, but the groundskeeper tells her it's not worth it. So Sarah has reconsidered her goals by the time Michelle finds her. Well. I came here to die so I could live forever, but Dick here convinced me that it wasn't such a great idea. Also, the groundskeeper's named Dick in this story and not Horace. Flexible continuity. But in all the chaos, Steve gets scared to death. 
and he is the 1000th Happy Haunt. Which, um, leads to the mansion getting sucked up into the ground? Well, that was certainly, uh, something. And this was all leading somewhere, because in the final issue, issue 7, we got part 1 of a spin-off, a joint spin-off, of both The Mystery of the Mance and the interview, The Misery of the Mance. While the mansion's being sucked into whatever wormhole it's being sucked into, Gracie seems to come back to life, back to his human form. He tries to explain to Steve that he's dead, but even he doesn't understand what happened afterwards, until Leota shows up, once again in full body form. I'm here to see you get your just rewards, William. I'm here for you to face judgment. Judgment? What are you talking about, you crazy witch? I'm talking about how while you were murdering me, I was cursing you to a thousand years of suffering and agony. <laughs> condemning you to feel the wrath and anguish of everyone you had murdered in your worthless lifetime. Well, that should come as a relief to the mummy that the curses weren't all his fault. Turns out Leota used to talk about when the thousandth ghost arrived, something big would happen. Some horrible fate. And with the mansion seemingly being dragged to hell, Sarah dives in after it. And... The saga ends on that cliffhanger, because of all the stories leaked from issue 8, uh, the follow-up to this was not one of them. At least not yet. So, we'll never know where that story was going, but it was certainly an unexpected direction. I didn't love every individual story here, but I really liked the format of this series. An anthology of mansion stories with overlapping, but not necessarily identical continuities. Much like the ghost stories surrounding the mansion itself, they can't all be true, but maybe they all have a bit of truth. I wish I could have seen where the ongoing story was going, but in the meantime, I'm glad the stories that were published are here for our enjoyment. Then the 2010s came around, and two years in a row, we got video games that feature a version of Disneyland. Or in the first case, a sort of netherworld Disneyland. Yes, the first game is Epic Mickey, the video game whose development required Disney to trade a whole-ass human being to Universal for a rabbit. Epic Mickey is set in the Wasteland, where forgotten characters live. Some of them are characters whose stories were told, but have since been forgotten. Others are characters who were abandoned before they were even released. And Oswald has shaped the Wasteland into a bizarro Disneyland, building attractions that parallel the Disney attractions, and even building animatronics of the Mickey gang. The game's full of deep Disney fan service, with main levels being set in these bizarro Disney park realms, and in-between levels set in these side-scrolling takes on classic Mickey cartoons. The Wasteland's equivalent of New Orleans Square is the Bog-Easy, and it's populated with some familiar haunts. Yep, big surprise, it's the Lonesome Ghosts, who apparently have been forgotten despite showing up several times in previous adaptations covered on this list. Maybe someday I'll get tired of seeing them pop up in mansion adaptations, but I doubt it. I love those silly guys. Here, the side-scroller levels are based on Lonesome Ghosts, as well as a few other Mickey cartoons, and you finally get to the Wasteland's equivalent of the Haunted Mansion, Lonesome Manor, an imposing mansion cobbled together from unfinished pieces of Haunted Mansions around the world. I like that Lonesome Manor incorporates a mishmash of all mansion designs, but uh, kind of a missed opportunity to not just have this be the Museum of the Weird. Inside the manor, there's architecture reminiscent of the mansion, as well as familiar your marble busts who give you advice, platform puzzles with floating tables, and plenty of restless spirits for you to rescue. Then there's a fun twist on the stretching room with variants of the portraits that are familiar but not identical to the ones we know. Boy, did this lady marry all of the singing busts? You have to realign them so that the portions are lined up properly. A simple but effective little puzzle. I enjoyed it. Much more fun than the Famicom take on the stretching room. Then there's the library, which is in chaos right now, and this is where you meet Madame Leona. Leona, with an N. The game leaves it ambiguous whether Leona Leona is a forgotten draft of Leota, or if she's a creation of Oswald in his bizarro theme park, but she's basically Leota in everything but one letter. We know she's not a tune because Thinner doesn't work on her and just kinda annoys her. She wants you to restore order to the library, and she has other tasks for you as well. You don't have to do all the tasks, but the more you do for her, the more she'll help you out later. So this Leona variant on Leota is not quite as benevolent as some, not quite as vicious as others. She's very much a you-scratch-my-back-I'll-scratch-yours type, and you know, that's fair enough. 
I think that's a good place for Leota to be. Also, there's a hatchet here that belongs to Constance, who was apparently once the owner of Lonesome Manor. I love that Constance used to run the manor. I imagine she was a resident of Wasteland up until the moment she was brought back to the real world to replace the Beating Heart Bride. Then there's the ballroom, where the organ is giant, sentient, and grumpy. You can befriend him by somewhat tediously jumping on the keys he wants you to play. It's annoying, but still less annoying than a lot of the games I've played today. Then you make your way up the pipes to the attic. And in the attic, you fight the Mad Doctor, and it doesn't have that much mansion -y stuff, so I don't have to keep talking about it. Out of all the video games I've played for this video, this may not be the best mansion adaptation, but it is far and away the most fun game. I'm actually going to continue playing this game for fun, and uh, that is not something I can say about the others. Then in 2011, we got a far more faithful version of Disneyland Park in Connect Disneyland Adventures. This faithfully recreates the park layout, minus corporate sponsorship and Lucasfilm rides, since this was before the buyout. But much like all the earlier video games, the attractions are represented with mini games, most of which are built around the Kinect motion control. But then in 2017, the game was re-released for Xbox One and Windows as simply Disneyland Adventures, no Kinect required. So there's also controller and keyboard controls available. I couldn't get either of the Xbox versions or the Windows version to work on my MacBook no matter what emulator I use, so I played the Windows version on my roommate's computer, which is a bit old and slow, so I played it on the lowest possible graphics settings, and even then the controls weren't super responsive. I can't judge if that's a problem with the game itself or just the computer I was using, so I won't let that factor into my review too much, I just want to see how this game represents the Haunted Mansion. I approached the mansion and noticed that the area that was at the time the Fast Pass Station just leads right into the main queue which has the singing bus. That's fun. Then I ran past all the people waiting in line to skip ahead because I'm the main character and I wait for nothing, except the loading screen, which has me falling in space for an approximate eternity. But once it got close to loading, I was given the helpful advice of don't tumble into something, which is just good to keep in mind throughout life, and careful of the painting. As soon as we enter the mansion, we find ourselves outside the exterior we just came in through, but now it's dark. In fairness, that does sometimes happen in actual Disneyland Resort attractions. And we get Paul's dialogue read by Corey. At least he's not doing Hans this time. But as soon as I'm inside, a ghost warns me to go back, so I run into the stretching room where Leota is mad that I've shown up. I guess this is another villain Leota take. So the room stretches and the ghosts drop me and the gameplay begins as I collect coins while trying not to tumble into something, and Cory reads Paul's lines in a seemingly random order. Is this haunted room actually stretching? Or is it your imagination? Hmm? Of course, there's always my way. You know, conversations mean things, right? With the very occasional new line that actually justified hiring Corey instead of just reusing Paul's audio. There's iconic pieces of mansion furniture that you don't want to bump into. Is the coffin occupant waving at me? That's fun. Then there's this bit where I figured out too late that what you're supposed to do is make the pose in the hole to fit through the painting. This was clearly designed for connect motion controls. Still, as far as I can tell, the worst thing that happens if you screw up in the game is you lose some coins. There seems to be no actual death in this game, so even the tedious parts here are far less frustrating than in most of the other games I've played. The second mansion minigame is Escape the Mansion, where you're moving from room to room and there's ghosts, and you're supposed to defeat them. You can do this either by shining a flashlight on them for long enough, or just by ducking and letting them go. That counts as winning. If they fly over you while you're ducked, you get the points, even if it looks like they touched you. If they go through you while you don't duck, you get hurt. But again, there's no actual death in this game, so do whatever you want. Really, the only thing you need to do in this part is move your character so they don't just get stuck behind something. You go through several mansion rooms and can choose some alternate paths at some point. Each room is a fun rendering, even if the actual gameplay is a tad repetitive and uninvolved. Then when you're done with all that, you move up the stairs and Phineas possesses this suit of armor and becomes a completely different ghost and starts chasing you. And on the PC version, you're supposed to repeatedly hit P to run, not just hold it, as I eventually figured out. But again, no death, so even if he catches you, he doesn't really catch you. He just keeps chasing you, down the hallway, around the conservatory, through the corridor, and eventually into the seance room. Then in a cutscene, you knock the grandfather clock into him, because it's not like defeating him might have made for fun gameplay. And now you're in the seance room, moving around the table while Leota chants that things fly at you. 
Once again, you attack ghosts with the flashlight, and you can kill Leota with the flashlight, but I don't wanna. Unlock the crypt with a skeleton key. Key? Crypt? Damn it, are you the movie version of Leota? That's it, you're dead. Haunt! That didn't feel good. I don't like killing Leota. But you don't have to kill Leota, you can just make your way around the table and leave. And making it through the room defeats her off camera or something. Now you're in the ballroom, and as you make your way down, Constance is the big boss now. I guess she didn't want to wait for you to come to the attic. I'm more okay killing Constance than Leota, because, you know, Constance is a murderer. There are other ghosts that aren't bothering you, and you can defeat them, but you don't have to. This isn't like the side-scrollers. The ones who aren't bothering you can just be ignored. Although, if you only destroy one dancer, it is kind of funny watching their partner just continue to dance without them. What? Oh, she's gone? Oh, I hadn't noticed. I was only thinking about me. Anyway, you make your way through the ballroom, skip the attic and the graveyard, and get a final cutscene with the hitchhikers. The gameplay is nothing to write home about, but I like seeing the mansion characters and rooms rendered here. I would love a full game with these assets, something on the scale of the 2003 game, but, you know, more fun than that. Then, three years later, we get another story set at Disneyland, as the mansion features into the final book in the Kingdom Keeper series, The Insider, released April 1st, 2014. The Kingdom Keeper series is another thing that I was aware of, but never actually read myself. In fact, I've never read any Ridley Pearson. My only exposure to him was the times Dave Barry mentioned being friends with him in his columns, and I definitely do not have time to read all of the Kingdom Keeper series, but I'm told the mansion doesn't come into play until the final book, so time to listen to an audiobook of a series finale with no context. I always thought this place was haunted for real, Maybach says. The two pass an antique vanity with an oval mirror. On the vanity, a pair of scissors glints in the light. There's an ivory-handled hairbrush, a box of face powder. Charlene approaches the vanity, touches the hairbrush. She pulls a strand of hair away. It's black. Save the estate sale shopping for another time. That would be Leota. Wouldn't Leota's hair be blue? In the haunted mansion, the story, Madame Leota was in love with Master Gracie. She killed Constance, his blonde bride, and stuck her in a trunk in the attic, hoping that with Constance gone, Master Gracie would love her instead. But it backfired. Gracie hanged himself. People think Leota died of old age and returned to haunt the mansion. So it sounds like in this world, the canon backstory of the mansion is not really any backstory we've encountered yet, but closest to the backstory in the Mystery of the Mansion comics. Leota is a spurned, jealous lover. Things would probably go easier for the Kingdom Keepers if the coloring book had been canon and she was just the lady of the house. What if ghost stories are real? Comes the voice from the dark. You clever girl. I know that voice, Charlene says in a hush. It's Madame Leota. I mean, it could also be Maleficent, except apparently you already killed Maleficent. I should probably read this whole series. An emaciated form with an ancient, withered face appears out of the dark. The deeply creased skin is sucked back over high cheekbones like fruit left too long in the sun. The eyes are the gray-blue of lake ice. The nose withered to a black hole beneath what appears to be a shriveled red chili pepper. The specter's cracked lips have been smeared with red grease paint, forming a hideous cavity absent of teeth, but occupied by a black tongue that ticks back and forth like a clock's pendulum. That's... her? Charlene can barely speak. Really? Because I did not get that from this description. This is no Leota I know. With fingers like her former nose and a neck like a turkey's, Madame Leota is the single most hideous human, female or male, the two have ever seen. I don't get it. Why does Leota keep getting such unflattering depictions? Leota Toombs was an attractive woman, and Madame Leota is scary but not ugly. What's going on here? Wait, he didn't want to marry her? Maybach says to Charlene. Go figure. Then later on, some guests are riding the mansion, and they see both in-ride Leota and this weird, scary, not Leota Leota. A hideous Madame Leota approaches, not at all the headless woman in the glass ball, but it's her. Somehow, there's no denying it. Then later, later, some mansion ghosts attack the Little Mermaid ride. I guess they're just really drawn to Omnimovers. Suddenly, the worker swivels his head and looks directly at her. 
He has no eyes, only empty sockets below a shelf of prominent bone. His nose continues to twitch, and he licks his lips. Story withdraws, realizing that she has just seen a ghost from the haunted mansion. An overtaker. A nuisance. The worker claws his way out of the cloud, but a bolt of blinding light strikes him, leaving only a wisp of black ash where the ghost stood. Story glances from the catwalk to the floor below. She sees a white-bearded man, his bare torso projecting up out of the blue sea of the set, the remainder of his body invisible below the sculpted waves. King Triton. And then later, 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 the Keeper sneak into the mansion after dark to look for clues, and they find one on the grandfather clock. It's quite clever, really. The clock is numbered for 13 hours, not 12. I might have missed the hieroglyph altogether, but I was intrigued by the clock only having one hand, and happened to look where the hand joins the mechanism. Jess dons her pair of glasses. On the metal stub that connects the clock's one hand to the mechanism behind the face is a tiny Osiris hieroglyph, no bigger than a collar button. Thirteen, Jess says, as in the thirteen pieces of Osiris. Yeah, and the hieroglyph to make sure that number is noticed. Anyway, I got the book on Kindle to command F to see if Leota or Mansion comes up anywhere further in the book, and uh, it doesn't, and this book is long, so I am curious to check out this series someday, but I don't have time right now. I gotta move on to the next batch of Haunted Mansion comics. Yes, when Disney acquired Marvel, they started the Disney Kingdoms line of comics, several different ongoing stories based on Disney attractions, and one of them was The Haunted Mansion. Now, unfortunately, this supplanted the SLG comics, so this is probably the reason those ones ended on an unsatisfying cliffhanger, but at least this one's trade is still in print. Earlier, there had also been a Disney Kingdoms line inspired by Rolly Crump's Unmade Museum of the Weird, which is also included in this collection, and I haven't read the Seekers of the Weird comics yet, but... Flipping through it here, it doesn't seem to feature any characters who actually made it into the mansion attraction. So while that does count as being mansion adjacent, I'm not covering it here. If I'm not including Phantom Manor adaptations, I'm not including adaptations of unbuilt things. Now, unlike the SLG comics, this is a single ongoing story with a single continuity, but right off the bat, tribute is paid to the varying different backstories given to the mansion, with a collection of locals telling creepy old stories about the creepy old house. Then we meet 15-year-old Danny and his explorer grandpa. Is this somehow also going to be an adaptation of that ice exploration show that used to be at Bush Gardens? Do you know where you're going next? To the top of the majestic and snowy Matterhorn. Hey, at this point, climbing the real one is probably less painful than riding the ride. Or maybe not, since Grandpa dies in an avalanche and Danny's life is in a malaise after that. But one lonely night, he receives a vision of Madame Leota begging him to come to the mansion. Danny... Come to the mansion now. Your grandpa needs you. It's your grandpa, Marty. Something's got to be done about your grandpa. So Danny summons all of his courage. I could check it out. It's just a house. A house you now know for a fact has something supernatural going on with it, but hey, whatever you need to cope. So Danny starts to move through the mansion, and it starts out being another character goes through the scenes of the ride in order story, but with a few changes. Notably, Danny does not see a hanging body, at least not yet. The changing paintings actually come to life, and the subjects of the paintings start chasing Danny until they chase him into the seance room. Enough! How dare you enter my chamber? You will leave my guest alone. So if our protagonist is Leota's guest, I guess technically in this story, Leota is the ghost host. No disrespect to Pete Renaday, but they should have just had Eleanor read the host lines for story and song. I am the great and benevolent Madame Leota. Benevolent in this continuity, anyway. Leota tells Danny that she summoned him to break the curse of an evil sea captain who has taken over the mansion and trapped the ghosts, destroying them if they don't turn evil. Only a living person can break the curse, for reasons I don't quite follow, but I'm rolling with this much more happily than I am with the movie's confusing half-explained rules, and Leota claims Danny was the only one she could reach because of his connection with his grandfather, who is somewhere in the mansion. So once again, Madame Leota has summoned a mortal to help with the curse. But at least this time I don't have to tediously button mash against a giant spider. But how am I supposed to help? I saw the monsters from the paintings, but I haven't seen any ghosts. Wait, you haven't? I could have sworn this guy was a ghost. 
Yeah, he came from a painting, but still. But much like in the ride, Leota's seance is the linchpin. Once she chants her spell, now Danny can see ghosts. Danny agrees to do his best, but Leota offers one final warning. But you must avoid the attic. At all costs. You do not want to run into Constance the Bride. Hopefully she doesn't come down to the ballroom like she did in that Connect adventure. The chapter ends on a cliffhanger, as it turns out Danny's on the radar of both the captain and Constance. I'm coming for you, Danny. We've been dying to have you. In chapter two, the ghosts lead Danny to the ballroom for the swing and wake. But unlike in the Connect adventure, Constance dares not follow into that cursed room. Danny's confused that the cursed ghosts are partying, but Pickwick explains. I am Pickwick, and what better way is there to spend eternity than partying? You should see what we do for Christmas, it's a nightmare. Which is fine, it's just annoying that it's nightmare during Halloween too. We already have 999 ghosts. How would you like to help us round it up to the epic 1000? I'm reasonably certain that won't open a portal to hell in this comic's continuity. Pickwick explains that because the captain was one of the few people to die within the mansion, he was granted power over some of its magic. I guess it's like how if you keep dying at the same part of Super Mario 3D World, they give you extra power-ups out of sympathy. So it seems like the easy solution would be for Danny to die and then he can defeat the captain on his own terms. But Danny doesn't want to, so that's not an option. The first to fall under the captain's thrall were apparently the ghosts in the dueling portraits who attempt to shoot Danny, but fortunately they have Stormtrooper aim. When Pickwick asks why Danny's here, he reminisces about his grandfather and how he taught him about bravery. I've taken a few falls myself, Danny. It happens. What matters is if you get back up and try again. Your grandmother taught me that. She might have learned it from Leota talking to Jim Evers in an awkwardly shoehorned character arc moment, but she taught it to me much more organically. Do... do you miss her? Dearly, someday I will find her again. Someday I'll find her, your long-dead grandmother, my lover, your grandma, and me. Pickwick tries to cheer Danny up with the party, and his cheering up turns a bit sinister. You can tell from the red eyes, that can't possibly be good. Meanwhile, the painting subjects report back to the pirate captain, who monologues his backstory about what brought him to the mansion. Then on the dying breath of an old witch doctor, I was told a tall tale of a mansion that was haunted, but full of enough treasure to gift any pirate who found it more riches than a king. Me crew was sure that I had lost me marbles, but I knew this treasure was me destiny. I sailed far and wide, traveling to any and all haunted lands I could find, but none held what I desired. One day I chanced upon this mansion. As soon as I set foot on this land, I knew in my heart that this is what I had set sail for. The treasure would be mine! I plundered the halls and believed that the treasure would be deep within the flooded basement below. But instead, I walked the plank. Okay, but never mind that. You apparently found the submarine voyage sea serpent and the primeval world dinosaurs. Those seem like pretty big discoveries. The captain still has yet to find the treasure, but he thinks the mortal can help him. Meanwhile, Danny gives in and decides to party for a few minutes. Okay, maybe for a minute. May I have this dance? See, that's the way. Don't waste time in a suicide race with your friend. Just walk up and ask for a dance. So Danny starts enjoying himself, and the spell of the ballroom takes hold over him as he starts to forget why he's there. Chapter 3 begins with the captain's fruitless pursuit of the treasure. I've searched this black-spotted mansion for decades. I love the cutlass my death gifted me, but no amount of magic is worth being my room. All I've been needing is to find the treasure so that I may leave these hellish halls. This must be it. It has to be. If it took decades to search every room except one, I don't know if I'd be more relieved or annoyed that it was indeed in that last room. But it's a moot point anyway, since the room is, in fact, empty. Whoever crafted this mansion must have been a knave with a wicked sense of humor. Well, one of them had a wicked sense of humor, the other was just a fan of scaring children. So the captain decides once and for all he's gonna need the kids' help, and he crashes the party. And since the curse he put on the ballroom works too well, Danny's not scared. Not even when the captain turns the ghost scary. Only once he's physically removed from the room does the spell start to wear off and he starts to remember why he's here and that the captain is evil. And now, that evil captain is coming right for him, and his host, Leota, is nowhere to be found. He's gonna need a new guy to help him out of this predicament, but what ghost could possibly be powerful enough to stand up to the captain? Excuse me, young man. Would you mind closing that door? 
the commotion could wake the dead. And hold for studio audience applause. So the Hatbox ghost offers to help Danny escape by giving him a tour. Now he's the ghost host and the pirate is his enemy. We got the same basic players as the Mystery of the Mance comic. We're just flipping around roles. That fool! Nothing but trouble since his return! I love how in just 13 years, we went from a movie where the fan service references to the ride were mostly distractions from the main story, to this comic, where even the fourth wall meta jokes about the actual attraction are narratively motivated. Case in point, the next page. The Endless Staircase. No mortals have ever seen this room in this house. Some have seen it in Liberty Square, but never in New Orleans. So the MC Escher room from the Florida mansion is a portal between all haunted locations in the world. And Old Hatbox has a specific philosophy on haunted houses. You see, the magic within the mansion reaches far and wide. Some are built as resting place for spirits once they wish to retire from their haunting days. Some are places of pure magic for fun and exploration. Others for the mystic and macabre. But they are all built as reminders that in death, we should celebrate life. You know, I wasn't expecting the ghost with an evil smile to have such an uplifting outlook on life, but I kind of dig it. The dead enjoy their happy haunting, but they still remember the value of life. I can't! This is all just too much for me. I, I hate to say it, but I'm afraid, okay? Anything that isn't a little scary in life usually isn't worth doing. Oh, and once again, a better lesson about facing your fears than Eddie's kid had. I love how we've had two comics that both seem in part to be correcting the mistakes of the movie, and yet they still go in their own distinct interesting directions with it. So Hatbox leads Danny to a room that's not in the New Orleans mansion, the library. But as soon as Hatbox leaves, Danny's intercepted by the captain who has taken Leota captive and forces her to confess the truth. Your grandfather's ghost is not in the mansion. I lied, Danny. Aww. Yes! Leota explains that it had to be a living person because the living can't call the mansion their home, which I guess means they have to be able to either escape or die. But the captain tires of her exposition and smashes her ball to a million pieces! But this time there's no lifeless head for the kid to accidentally grab and traumatize himself with. So the captain takes Danny himself and tells him to go to the attic and confront Constance for the treasure. Chapter 4 begins with a flashback to 1879, the day of Constance's final wedding. She's already planning to kill her newest husband. Then in the present, the captain posits that being killed in the mansion on her final wedding night gave Constance the power to kill not just the living, but also the dead. Make them extra dead. The captain threatens to kill Danny if he doesn't go up to the attic, but Pickwick and the ballroom ghosts save him in the nick of time now that they're no longer under the ballroom spell. But Pickwick wants Danny to go into the attic anyway because he remembers seeing a window up there. The captain chases Danny up and up until he runs into someone he should have seen in the stretching room, but I guess the very his hosts finally succeeded at not frightening someone prematurely. Remembering encouragement from his grandfather, he enacts an action sequence that's, well, kinda grotesque, but he makes it across the other side, swinging onto a decaying skeleton. And all the skeleton lost was a couple of bones and an eyeball. He makes it up to the attic, sneaks around avoiding Constance, and finds an empty treasure chest. But he sees the window and realizes it must be the way out, just in time to be caught by Constance. There is no way out. It will be dark soon. The chapter ends with Danny falling backwards out the window, just as we the guests theoretically do at this point in the ride, depending on whose fan theory you're following. But the final chapter opens, and Danny did not die from his fall. Aw, oh, isn't that swell? We get a cameo from... Dick or Horace or Clyde. The book doesn't make a choice on his name, but he quickly gets scared away because the ghosts are finally free. Once Danny completed his chilling challenge and found the way out, all the ghosts could roam as they choose. But that includes the captain, who threatens a new reign of terror. But despite his fear, Danny stands up to him. I broke the curse and beat you because I used the fear. Okay, use fear on captain. And it didn't work, I'm dead. Thanks a lot, Roberta Williams. And Danny's about to be dead too, but he's saved at the last minute by... Grandpa! 
Honestly, with the way their relationship has been shown over the course of this comic, this appearance hits me just as hard as the appearances of Leota and the Hatbox Ghost. This comic actually made me excited for its original characters. I can't believe a mansion adaptation is actually using, like, storytelling. Turns out Grandpa wasn't in the mansion because he's been with Danny all along, but he couldn't follow him into the mansion because of the curse. But he's so proud of him. It's so sweet. I'm legitimately emotionally invested in the relationship of the mortal kid in a haunted mansion story. How did that happen? But the captain gets back up and is once again on track to slaughter everyone until he's decapitated by Constance. Okay, I kind of love that Constance's role in this story is basically the T-Rex in Jurassic Park. She's terrifying, stay away from her, but if you're being threatened, she'll save the day because she wants to kill the one threatening you even more. You may continue, as you were. It'll be nice to have things back to normal before my wedding day. And besides, I hate pirates. They sing too much. Yeah, but I doubt this dead one was singing much about a pirate's life for him. Well, with the curse lifted and the spirits of the mansion restored, the option to come and go is ours again. That was all we wanted, true freedom. And we want to stay! See, how hard was that 2003 movie? The curse is lifted, now the ghosts can truly be the happy haunts they were always meant to be. You could have even had Master Gracie and Elizabeth choose to go to heaven, but the others choose to stay. It was so easy! Also, the curse being lifted means Leota can reform herself, and of course, the mansion itself was the treasure all along. The real treasure was the houses we haunted along the way. Leota apologizes for lying, Danny forgives her, and now that he can see ghosts, he meets his grandmother. Damn it, comic book based on a theme park ride. Stop making me cry over the family of what's supposed to be the boring human character. Danny's grandparents tell him to live his life and they go off on adventures together. We get an epilogue with Danny talking about the current state of the mansion. Everyone's happy except the captain. The captain's head is being kept away from his body to make sure he doesn't completely reform like the other ghosts and cause any trouble again. Well, the other comics started with the pirate captain's head being kept in the hatbox. It's only fitting that this one ends with the pirate captain's head being kept in the hatbox. Danny knows the town is still scared of the mansion, so in order to help the people understand, he puts up the original teaser sign for the attraction. How is this comic using fan service this well and still keeping to a core emotional story? What wizardry is this? Life has moved on for Danny too, and he and his family have learned to grieve together. Although grieving is probably easier for Danny now that he knows his grandfather is still around as a ghost, but you know, he hasn't seen him recently. But he has seen some ghosts recently, some ghosts who followed him home. This book changed a ghost will follow you home from a sinister warning to an uplifting promise. That might be considered sacrilegious by some Mansion fans, but I think this story absolutely earned it. I loved this comic. It had just about everything I'd want from a Mansion story, except maybe the singing bus, but pretty much everything else, and it made me care about its own original characters, which is a real uphill battle for Mansion adaptations, let me tell you. It probably helps that at no point is this trying to fully explain the backstory of the Mansion. This is just a story that happens in the Haunted Mansion, and it can coexist with others, as long as you give some characters leeway to switch allegiances. And as a Haunted Mansion story, it is one of my favorites. In fact, it's pretty much the original reason I'm doing this video. I initially had this idea long before the new movie was confirmed because I picked up and flipped through this comic years ago at the gift shop in New Orleans Square. And at the time, the only other real attempt I'd encountered to turn the Haunted Mansion into a narrative was the Eddie Murphy movie. And I was just blown away by how this comic did it so much better. And it opened my eyes to the many ways one could tell better stories about the mansion. So this one holds a special place in my heart and it's still one of my favorites. I think it absolutely holds up. Then July 5th, 2016 saw the publication of a book entitled Disney Parks Presents the Haunted Mansion. This is the republishing from October 30th, 2018, just in time for Halloween. I believe the original edition came with a CD that has grim grinning ghosts. Uh, this does not because who had CD players anymore? Me, but who else? This is a storybook or coffee table book that just illustrates the lyrics to the song from the ride, with illustrations by James Gilliard. Okay, Leota here is less unflattering than the early storybooks, but uh, she still could use a skincare regimen. It's more of a direct translation than an adaptation. It doesn't really attempt to interpret the story in any way, it just shows beautiful illustrations of the scenes we love while we can listen to the song we love. 
but it does technically count as adapting the visuals of the mansion into another medium, and it's a fine example at that. Then, starting on July 19th, 2016, and ending on July 16th, 2019, four books were published in a series entitled Tales from the Haunted Mansion. And yes, Tales from the Haunted Mansion is different than Enter If You Dare Scary Tales from the Haunted Mansion. These tales do not claim to be scary. But you know what these tales are? From the Haunted Mansion, more so than these tales. Tales from the Haunted Mansion, Volumes 1 and 2. Transcribed by John Esposito, as told by a mansion librarian, Amicus Arcane. These books are transcribed by a mortal human writer named John Esposito because they were written by Amicus Arcane, librarian of the Haunted Mansion, who basically serves as the story's version of the ghost host. Welcome, foolish listener, to the illustrious library of... Well, you know where you are. Allow me to introduce myself. I am your guide, Amicus Arcane, the sole librarian and entrusted keeper of 999 bone-chilling tales. The first book is called The Fearsome Foursome, about a group of kids named Tim, Willa, Noah, and Steve, who bond over their love of scary stories, and they receive a mysterious invitation to the mansion. So they gathered after dark, carding standard storytelling paraphernalia, flashlights, marshmallows, and blankets, and made their way to the unwelcoming wrought iron gate of a sprawling estate. As a mansion adaptation, I knew I was in good hands when we got the first description of the mansion itself, which not only homages the attraction's blend of disparate styles, but finds an in-narrative reason to resemble both coast mansions and reference a foreign spin-off. It was an imposing structure of a time and a place all its own, erected from brick and mortar, and a touch of grand imagination. Its very design was a contradiction in styles. Turrets jutted into the clouds like a centuries-old gothic, while stone columns adorned the entrance like something you'd see in an antebellum manor. What the fearsome foursome couldn't know was that the mansion looked whichever way they thought it should appear, as if it was some kind of phantom manor. Admittedly, some of the prose is a little overwritten, and that's coming from me. It's clearly going for like a Douglas Adams-y, the ships hung in the air much in the same way bricks don't sort of thing, and a lot of it works, but some of it is just a little overdone. J just a smidge. And then something utterly bizarre for a book called Adventures in Happyville took place. But for one called Tales from the Haunted Mansion, it was not so unusual at all. At the start, I thought for a second this book was going to be another characters move through the scenes of the ride in order, since the kids do go to the stretching room. Hey guys, I hate to break it to you. We're not going anywhere. There are no windows and no doors. Panic would have set in had Willa not been leaning against the false wall. Right on cue, it glided open to reveal a secret passageway. She couldn't resist embracing this magical moment. There's always my way. Had they remained a second longer, they would have witnessed a series of lightning flashes flickering from the dome, and then they would have seen the figure of a man hanging by a noose from the rafters. But they had already moved on, so they were spared. Unlike you, foolish listener. But then they get to the library, and the meat of the book begins. The librarian, Amicus Arcane, reads all the kids' scary stories about them. Master Timothy, continued the librarian, are you ready to hear your tale? What do you mean, my tale? The first story is all about you, and that remarkable old glove you found. Tim's story, Lonigan's Glove, is about his love of baseball and the time he took the glove of the legendary Lefty Lonigan, a glove that comes with its share of curses. Willa's story, Witch Bone, is about her making a wish to bring her dead guinea pig back to life, with dire results. Noah's story, Sea Creatures, is about him mail-ordering some instant sea monsters to prank his awful stepdad, and it goes too far. And Steve's story, The Dare, is about a series of escalating dares that also go too far. Now, like the earlier book, the first three stories aren't that mansion-specific, although they pepper in plenty of Disneyland references. Tim found himself standing on a ball field. He located the scoreboard over the right field wall. 
he could make out some lettering faded from the sun. No, it couldn't be. It wasn't possible. The date said July 17th, 1955. Quick, get to Anaheim so you can stop that one girl from having to make out with Bob Cummings. The dares were usually pretty harmless. So far, no one had gotten into any real trouble. Although Andy Kenderson did receive an in-school suspension for picking his nose while placing his lunch order. (laughs) Andy Kenderson. That one took me a second. Nice reference to Ken Anderson there. There are lots of other characters named after Imagineers. uh, So many, in fact, that I do not have time to cut them all together. He reached up to detach the safety bar that propped open the lid. Steve got to it first, the genial host. Don't pull down on the safety bar. I will lower it for you. Yeah, the final story starts with just references like the first three, but then when Steve gets to the graveyard at night, that's when we're firmly in mansion territory. To compensate, he switched his cell to night vision mode. Moving it back and forth, he picked up an image. There were three dudes hunched together by the side of the road, Hitchhikers, in old-fashioned attire, thumbing for a lift. An unnatural glow pulsated around them. Probably a camera defect or a lens flare. Steve couldn't tell which. But when he glanced up to see them live, the hitchhikers were gone. They must have found a ride. Good for them. Even before that last story got more mansion-y, I found myself more accepting of the disparate ghost stories of this book than I did of the earlier book, because this one started with such a mansion-y framing device. That went a long way to selling me on whatever the book wanted to throw at me. At the end of the book, the truth is revealed. These stories are all real, but these children have forgotten. They are the newest residents in the mansion. And they go from scared to excited. Their ethereal forms took flight, joining the other spirits in their midst. Music swept in from beyond the bookshelves. The party was just getting started, and Willa so wanted to join in. Let's go, Timbo. Take me dancing. She took Tim's hand and floated through the wall in search of the ballroom. A moment later, the rest of Tim's parts followed. The book series continues in a similar format. Each book features someone coming in contact with the mansion and hearing ghost stories before learning some sort of a truth. Some of these ghost stories are backstories of specific mansion residents. Others are stories of ghosts we don't necessarily know, but they all feel like part of the same world, not only as the mansion, but as each other. Very unhappy returns. Why have you come back? The second book is called Midnight at Madame Leota's, and unfortunately, despite being the title character, Leota only has a cameo toward the end. The middle-aged medium in the speckled bandana and matching peasant dress called forth spirits from the netherworld. Or so she claimed. Spirit, present thyself, commanded Madame Harriet. What? You were expecting someone else? Patience, foolish listener. It's not yet midnight. The main character of book two is actually Willa's brother, William, now a renowned skeptic, spending his life disproving the supernatural, but secretly hoping to find proof of it so he can talk to his sister one last time. In his searching, he finds the mansion, and Amicus tells him some stories. The librarian reached for a book on the highest shelf. It floated down to his hand, volume two engraved on its spine. What are you doing? William asked. Selecting a tale. The librarian sank into the high-backed velvet chair and opened the old tome. The first story in this book is set at a carnival, and it features a pretty girl named Jane and her jealous friend Connie. Is Connie Constance Hatchaway? No, no, she's not. Constance Hatchaway makes a cameo later in this book, but also the ghost of Connie shows up separately, so no, Connie is not Constance. I do like these books, but I guess they had to keep at least one piece of the Haunted Mansion adaptation's legacy of unnecessarily confusing elements. Jane wished only the best for Connie, and Connie wished only the best for Jane. The best demise, that is. It would be perfectly acceptable if Connie's best friend croaked suddenly. Jane was far too gifted, too pretty, too well-liked to live. But being Jane's best friend, Connie sincerely wished Jane's premature departure would be a painless one. Connie and Jane are riding a cheap spook house that bears some resemblance to the mansion attraction, but with what sounds like an 80th of the budget, and Connie decides to make Jane think she's going insane. 
It was the mirrors, Janie girl. What mirrors? The mirrors. A hundred thousand reminders of who I had become. And for a split second, Connie sounded like her old self again. Had become? What are you talking about? You're Connie. No, Jane. The other voice was back, whispering, hissing, declaring. I'm the ugly one. Okay, I need a Teen Girl Squad overlay for the Haunted Mansion right now. The four Gregs are Constance's murdered husbands. You're wasting my time, Mr. Arcane. That story had nothing to do with Madame Leota. Patience, Master William. All will be revealed in time. I'm ready now. In time repeated the librarian. The next story involves a kid named Ernie having to learn about his family history to prep for a school cultural festival. A banner featuring that year's International Day theme, It's a Small World, hung from the gymnasium bleachers. You can add the after all part if you like. You know you want to. Ernie was a quarter Romanian on his father's side, so Romania it was, which struck him as a total bummer. Team France was building an Eiffel Tower out of matchsticks. Team China, the Great Wall of Paper Mache. Claudia Coates over at Team Caribbean claimed she hailed from pirate stock. In a single sentence, a Claude Coates reference and a Pirates to the Caribbean reference. This author really knows how to squeeze the fan service in. But Romania? What in the world are they famous for? Transylvania, idiot! shouted Vicky Van Sloan from Team Holland. And vampires. I thought vampires lived in the Pacific Northwest. An official Haunted Mansion adaptation made a Twilight joke. What a time to be alive. Ernie crawled along creaky floorboards, passing holiday decorations, until he came upon the wooden crate exactly where he remembered it to be. As far as he could tell, the crate contained nothing of value, just some outdated evening wear, a suit and a cloak, along with a smattering of gray dust at the bottom. But Ernie accidentally brings a vampire back to life. I saw something. Calm down. No, you don't understand. I saw a man climb down the side of the house. He had hands like a lizard and wings like a bat. Because it's midnight! I don't know why this is the book that's bringing out all the Homestar references. I'm not interested in vampires. I only want to hear from... a ghost. My sister. After the second story, Billy gets really impatient, so he just starts exploring the mansion himself. After running through the M.C. Escher room, he finds himself somewhere else. The door flew open, and William barreled through, stumbling headfirst over a stack of metal canisters. Right away, he knew what they were. Old movie reels. He had somehow found his way into the mansion's projection booth. Didn't see that on the tour, did you? Well, no, but I assumed the Leota, Constance, and singing bust effects had to come from somewhere. The projector came to life, its take-up reel stubbornly pulling the film through its rusted gears. Arcane, I don't have time to watch a... The librarian pressed a bony finger to his lips. Shh! Don't spoil it for the audience. The next story is about a movie theater that gets foreclosed on by an evil banker, leaving its owner, Uncle Rory, to die of a broken heart. Just so much Naboo blood running through these stories. The day Uncle Rory died was the second worst day of Mark's life. The day Uncle Rory came back from the dead was the worst. But Rory's nephew Mark inherits the storage space full of old movies. Haunted old movies full of the ghosts of Hollywood's past. And those ghosts have their revenge on the evil banker. Trevelyan's disembodied head turned and handed it to a ghostly figure that had emerged from a mausoleum. The strange apparition held a cane and wore a top hat and a cloak with a high-pointed collar. He took the banker's head and placed it into a large container. A hat box, if you will. And once again, hold for studio audience applause. He stopped and slowly turned to look directly into the camera, directly at Mark. The audience demands a proper ending, he said. After that story, Billy leaves the projection room and finally makes his way to the attic, where he comes face to face with Constance, who again is not Connie. Excuse me, can you tell me about Madame Leota? The bride spun around, her feet never touching the floor. Cleota is dead, 
she hissed, floating toward William, her face obstructed by a veil. I'm the one you want. So many of these stories just can't get past the idea of the bride versus Leota. Whatever happened to strong women supporting each other? William closed his eyes, the dutiful suitor, as the axe went up. But as he awaited the final blow, a child's hand took hold of his, and William felt himself being whisked out of the attic. But Billy is rescued from Constance by a ghost girl named Camille. And the final story is hers. All right, let's go. What's her story? I thought you'd never ask. Basically, she was a mute girl in an abusive situation, and she gets stuck in a cellar, and, um, I don't want to get into the gross details, but the chapter is called The Roaches. Camille, where is she? Why do you care? She's merely a character in a story. Isn't that right, Master William? Finally, after all those stories, Billy gets his audience with Madame Leota. A large crystal ball filled with mist was floating above a table. He approached and, for the first time, did not question what he saw. Madame Leota. The mist inside the ball dissipated, forming a rim of wild blue hair. Then a face appeared. The visage of a handsome lady, surrounded by a phosphorescent glow. Finally, a book with a flattering depiction of Leota. Was that so hard? I seek forgiveness. His voice cracked, and she could barely hear him say, It's my fault. She's dead. Madame Leota's face turned red. Explain yourself. William's eyes grew heavy. It had to do with a pet. A guinea pig. You see, Chubbs was mine, and then he was hers, and... You're not going to believe this next part. I'm a floating head. Try me. And a self-aware Leota. It may just be a cameo here, but it's a very respectful cameo. I require something personal. He withdrew the item from his pocket. A bracelet with four charms representing each of his sister's pets. A rabbit, a parrot, a goldfish, and a guinea pig. So Leota conducts her seance, and Willa does not appear, but Noah and Steve do, and Leota makes them escort Billy to the ballroom, where he finally gets his audience with his sister. You never said goodbye, he added, as he placed it on her wrist. Most people never do. William bowed his head in shame. Billy apologizes because he felt responsible for Willa's death, but Willa absolves him of any guilt, and tells him that he has to go live his life and move on. They have a very touching goodbye. It's, it's a very sweet story. Once again, I'm getting emotional about original characters in a Haunted Mansion story. For William Gaines, the world was once again filled with the unexplainable, the unimaginable, the magical. The individual stories in this one were all pretty good, with, you know, varying levels of mansion connectivity, but the framing device was a beautiful meditation on grief and closure. This series is, like, good. Still here, foolish listener? Congratulations to you and a thousand curses to us. Book three, Grim Grinning Ghosts, follows a new gang of characters, a tough guy just out of the joint who joins some old colleagues to make a delivery to the mansion, where Amicus tells them the stories behind the items they're delivering. Enter freely. Pass through our spiked gates. Hear the cry of the raven and roam our cavernous corridors, where doors breathe and walls have eyes, where the things that haunt your dreams are real, and death is only the beginning. Are they referencing universal rides now? For when the sun goes down, the true nature of the mansion is revealed. The bit of backstory in this book does acknowledge the span of backstories given to the mansion over the years, but it establishes that they don't matter. It's precise history. Remains a mystery, concealed by fiction, contradicted by fact, one of the few glorious enigmas remaining in a world obsessed with origin stories. That's the way to do it, if you ask me. It's not about the how or the why of the mansion, it's just about the stories of the individual ghosts. There are some who claim it began as the residence of a certain Lord Gracie, heir to the Gracie fortune, who died under unusual circumstances. His body was discovered hanging under a skylight in the main foyer. Others cling to the tale of a merciless sea captain whose treasures remain hidden within the mansion's walls, along with the body of his late wife. 
Still others suggest the mansion was designed by a mad genius for the sole purpose of transforming it into a deadly amusement park. But nobody would believe that this was in an amusement park. The librarian lowered himself into an antique chair, like he was lowering himself into the grave, and he reached for a hardcover book that had been waiting for him on a music stand. Strange Musicality is about a piano, and more specifically, a piano teacher. The sonata he'd taken credit for had actually been composed by someone else. Someone who could no longer defend herself. We'll see about that. Basically, a young musical prodigy is getting acclaim for his original composition, and he's not telling anyone that he stole it from the dead music teacher, but he thinks he's getting away scot-free until he starts to hear the tune everywhere, in a very telltale heart sort of way. But, you know, with actual confirmed supernatural elements, and not just guilt. Amicus stopped by the head of the sarcophagus, where he knocked three times with his free hand. It's tea time. Some Tea with the Mummy is, as far as I can tell, not a reference to Tony's old show, but it is, as the name suggests, the backstory of the tea-drinking mummy and the tea brand he was once a mascot for. It came in three fabulous flavors, Original Blend, Earl Grey, and Bountiful Boysenberry. Okay, the Revenge of the Mummy quote might have been coincidence, but that had to be a Knott's tribute. We've officially moved beyond just Disney Park references. According to the packaging, Tusk's tasty tannis tea was derived from the ancient tannis plant, thought to be extinct until an expedition uncovered a remarkably virile specimen under the sands of Egypt. This centers on a cultural grave robber named Colonel Bartholomew Tusk, who has convinced himself that he doesn't have that evil a relationship with the cultures he explores. The colonel hadn't hurt anyone. He was a mostly honest businessman. And Tannis T had raked in an honest fortune fair and square. If it hadn't been Tusk, it would have been one of his competitors. Lord Henry Mystic, perhaps. Okay, and now we've officially referenced all the mansion-adjacent attractions that aren't actually the mansion. There is a curse explained the foreman. A most terrible curse. Colonel Tusk tis tisked the idea. Curses generally are terrible, that is. That's what makes them curses. Tusk raids Prince Ammon Moses' grave, despite a high priest warning to leave the tomb alone. In the tomb, Tusk finds all these tannis leaves, and true to Western explorer's ability to make money off of things that aren't theirs, he turns the leaves into a tea brand. What he doesn't know is that the tea can bring the mummy back to life and things do not end well for him. The librarian opened the book and, with Marge and Pasquale his unwitting audience, began to read our third and final tale. And the door that breathes is the backstory of, as you would expect, the breathing door, and it might be the saddest story in the entire series. The door is made of wood that was cut down from a sacred tree, a sacred tree that a young witch died trying to protect, and the witch's soul is in the door, and that's why it's breathing. And you disrespect it by calling it big-ass termites, Eddie? The breathing door was back where it belonged, inside the narrow corridor next to others of its kind. I'll be honest, I didn't enjoy the framing device of this one quite as much as I did of the first two. I just didn't really latch on to any of the characters this time around the way I did with the fearsome foursome and with Billy. But... All the individual stories in this one are great. I love them all as backstories for mansion residents. We want to leave, shouted Marge at the top of her lungs. But you can't leave, replied the librarian. Not without this. He slid his gloved hand into his jacket. Marge and Pasquale backed away, holding hands, anticipating the horror. What was he reaching for? The librarian removed a musty old billfold from his inside pocket. He opened it and began counting out money. Your final payment. Book four was published specifically for the Haunted Mansion's 50th anniversary. The party began on August 9th, 1969. I'm not sure what the in-universe significance of that date is, since I'm pretty sure the mansion in-world has been around longer than that, but maybe the ghosts were just hovering elsewhere and then made their way to the mansion on that date. The frame story here is about Prudence Pock, a name known from the Haunted Mansion Q. Prudence Pock is in an asylum where Dr. Ackerman checks in on her. And instead of Amicus, it's Prudence telling stories to Dr. Ackerman this time. First, we get a little story about the first time she went to the Haunted Mansion. She had visited Route 13 many times in the past. What respectable ghost rider hadn't? 
Her first time was when she was doing research for a story on those legendary hitchhiking ghosts, one of whom was a distant relation. Okay, so I'm guessing that line is because Phineas Pock is another name that comes up in the various mansion graveyards, and one of the hitchhiking ghosts is said to be named Phineas. So this book seems to be purporting that no matter what last name the comics gave him, that hitchhiking ghost is Phineas Pock, relative of Prudence Pock. I think that's what's going on here, but either way, I love that even the text of this book continues the mansion's history of providing a playground for fan theories. Instead, Prudence found herself looking into the eyes of a granite angel perched on a pedestal, its wings expanded, its hair seeming to change colors in the moonlight. In the mansion, Prudence meets the ghosts of the fearsome foursome, who had inspired her most successful books. Thanks for keeping our stories alive, said Tim, the one wearing a baseball uniform. I really like the movie version, added Noah, the chubby one. Part one, not so much the other ones. That kid they got to play me was lame, 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 chimed in Steve, the handsome one. And whose dumb idea was it to make Willa a boy? Well, I guess that's the only legitimate time that gender swapping someone in a horror comedy actually did ruin someone's childhood. Those happy haunts she'd heard about, the hitchhikers and the mummies and the brides with hatchets, they had all materialized. And just so we're clear, the haunts are mostly happy because you're not. Yes, that's it. The sense of humor of the Haunted Mansion is that it is making fun of us, the living. It's not about Eddie Murphy making fun of the mansion. It should be about the mansion making fun of Eddie Murphy. Their talk was intruded on by a long, labored moan, a dispirited plea of gloom. Cherry! Would you like to hear his tale, Doctor? So Prudence continues to tell Dr. Ackerman stories about the other residents of the asylum. The first story is called Class Brain, and it's about a young girl who was tasked with bringing a friend's dead brother back to life. A young girl named Shelley, get it? Ah, 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 this is another really sad one. Fueled by blind hatred, the mob began to chant, Destroy! 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 But the creature was not destroyed, and the mob stopped chanting when they heard the screeching tires, followed by a thud. Dr. Ackerman is skeptical about the story until he sees the reanimated creature with his own eyes in another room. So he returns to Prudence to hear the next story, A Pirate's Death for Me. Yeah, this one's got all the pirates' references. Visitors came to Displeasure Island for the pretty views and fine dining. But mostly they came to see the lighthouse, because it was extraordinary. This one's about a greedy kid who finds the secret of Captain Gore's treasure. As far as I know, no connection to Master Gracie this time. But he finds Captain Gore's treasure because of some ghosts, and, uh, he sacrifices his friends for the treasure like the twerp he is. They saw the old man's true self. That is, the true self he had corroded into. The lighthouse keeper was half skeleton, half rotted flesh. He wore tattered pirate clothes that hung from his shoulders like shredded rags. J.C. and Niles were too petrified to move. Yes, one of the friends is named Niles, and it's taking everything in me not to make yet another Fraser joke here. He dropped the lid, no longer interested in gold, and spun around to leave. The small shaft of light from the entrance abruptly disappeared. To his horror, the cave had once again been sealed. No way in, no way out. Or, if you prefer, no windows and no doors. So the poor innocent friends die, but also the twerp gets his come up, and so, you know, mixed level of happy ending. Immediately following the tale, Dr. Ackerman excused himself from room four, saying he had an errand to run. So at this point, Dr. Ackerman wants to see the mansion for himself. So he makes his way to the cemetery, where he's distracted by the headstones. Forgetting where he was, Dr. Ackerman laughed. He laughed because death suddenly seemed less serious. The amusing epitaphs made the inevitable less foreboding, at least momentarily. Ah, it's great. It's such a great distillation of what works with the mansion's blending of tones. We go back and forth between the silly and the scary, and each tone leaves you unprepared for the shift to the next tone, making the next tone hit harder. These books really understand the mansion. But then he finds the headstones of the subjects of Prudence's stories, and the headstone of Prudence herself. So Dr. Ackerman returns to hear Prudence's final story, Writer's Block. 
It's her own story, one that Dr. Ackerman doesn't remember being part of. The story of how, as her biggest fan, he lured her to a chilling challenge. Where are we, Doctor? In the catacombs below my home. The tour starts here. A Vincent Price narration would be most apropos, wouldn't you agree? I mean, maybe if your home was in Paris. The pit and the pendulum, exclaimed her tour guide, Dr. Ackerman. I had Poe's ingenious device meticulously recreated down to the most minute detail. And for the first time that evening, Prudence decided that her host was insane. We here at the mansion refer to that as a slow learner. Seeing as they're both such big Poe fans as well, Dr. Ackerman puts Prudence in front of Poe's desk and then Cask of Amontillados her in. She stepped over and gave the bars a tug. The door was locked, and Dr. Ackerman, peering in from the outer corridor, didn't seem to be joking. So Dr. Ackerman kills Prudence, but then when he digs her out, he finds her creepy smiling corpse and realizes that even in death, she's still writing Memento Mori over and over, and that drives him to madness. Yeah, 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 it's one of those stories where the doctor was actually the mad one the whole time. You probably saw that coming, but, you know, it's fun. For four glorious years, Doctor, I've been visiting you inside this padded room, repeating the tale of your crimes, watching the sanity drain from your eyes, night after night after night. I'm not going to spoil the very end of the book, but the denouement has a nice bit of full circleness for the entire series of books, a series that I ended up enjoying way more than I expected to. You know, it's like young adult horror fiction. I thought, yeah, these might be cute, but... These were really fun, with a nice mythology all its own, piggybacking off of the mansion lore in just a fun, creative way. I really liked these books, and I highly recommend them for any mansion fan. You should pick them up and flip through them because, you know, the text is great, the illustrations are great, but you should also listen to the audiobook because the narration's also great. Just however you want to consume these books, do it as soon as you can because, uh, yeah, these books are great. On a less in-depth note, in 2016 and 2017, there were some stop-motion shorts for Disney XD produced by Stupid Buddy Studios. These commercial bumpers feature Disney XD characters at the New Orleans Square Mansion encountering the characters and... interacting with them. <laughs> He's just giving us a thumbs up. Back at you, buddy. Uncle Scrooge? <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, it appears you are suffering a medical emergency. Please remain calm while I attempt to reattach your head. This will only take a moment. The Disney XD characters act like they do on their shows, and the mansion characters act like they do on the ride, often with actual ride audio. Hi, you must be the chef. Till death do us part. Uh, you wanna go now? I do. These are, you know, just there to be between commercial breaks, but they're cute. I dig them. I wouldn't mind seeing an entire stop-motion Haunted Mansion movie. Since, you know, we keep re-theming the Haunted Mansion after a stop-motion movie, why not? Then in 2018, uh, Madame Leota showed up on Once Upon a Time. Okay, so I watched the entire first season of Once Upon a Time when it aired, even though I never figured out if I enjoyed it. Like, I don't think I was enjoying it when I was watching it, but each episode ended on a cliffhanger that made me go, well, I gotta see what happens next. And then the season finale happened and I no longer needed to see what happened next. What's going on? The curse. I think you broke it. The curse of Dave being at all invested in what comes next. You broke it. So I haven't seen any Once Upon a Time since season one, and I'm definitely not catching up on all of it. I'm just going into the 11th episode of the final season, Blind. We'll see if this intrigues me as much as Kingdom Keepers. The Leota scenes happen when two characters who I'm told are Captain Hook and the Wicked Witch of the West are looking for the Wicked Witch's daughter, and they go to a secret witch shop. Yes, she is. Memento Mori. Now, I'm told that Memento Mori is the name of the mansion gift shop in Florida, and the idea of that gift shop is that it used to be Leota's shop, so having Leota in a store called Memento Mori is very good Florida fan service, I'm told. I don't actually know firsthand, because last time I was in Florida, the shop over there was still Yankee Trader, so... Anyway, they overhear Leota giving a familiar seance. Crawling. Oh. 
Let there be music from regions beyond. I'm just assuming that that's going to turn out to be the monkey from Toy Story 3. So Leota, played by Susie Joachim, is working with this character who I'm told is Mother Gothel. You dare interrupt my sales. I am Madame Leota. Give us the girl and then we leave. You and I will have our reckoning another day. Leave? How? This chamber has no windows and no doors. Uh, I guess Leota's the ghost host again. It's less interesting here than it is in the comics. To find a way out. Of course, there's always my way. So Leota's basically just here to shoehorn in some lines from the ride. She doesn't seem to be centered in the plot that much. I guess since she was one of the few bits of mansion lore that wasn't superfluous in the Murphy movie, they had to make her superfluous somewhere else. Stop! Mother, what are you doing here? I'm here to save you from the witch that kidnapped you. Nobody kidnapped me. I ran away. This place is so cool. Leota looks so out of place in every shot. It's like those memes of Big Bird sitting in a board meeting or marching with stormtroopers. This is a resurrection amulet. With it, one can resurrect a soul that has not yet fully surrendered to the other side. Today, you and I are going to use it to bring my dear Leota back to the realm of the living. So what do I have to do? To stand right where you are. And die. Okay, so Leota's there to be an almost dead person for the Wicked Witch's daughter to find out that Gothel's gonna sacrifice her? I guess Leota could be this evil. There's nothing in the ride that says she isn't, but it's not that fun a way to see Leota as far as I'm concerned. And the performance is... unremarkable. It's not terrible, but it's nothing particularly special. No disrespect to the actor. I'm sure she did it exactly as she was directed. She just wasn't directed to do anything remarkable with the role. But then the Wicked Witch comes and offers to sacrifice herself instead, so her estranged daughter is moved and threatens Gothel and Leota, and they just kinda peace out. And then I guess this Order of Witches comes back, so one of them might still be Leota, but she's not, like, identifiable anywhere else in the series. Yeah, I gotta say, I'm not feeling the urge to watch all the Once Upon a Time I missed. It's official, Once Upon a Time is no Kingdom Keepers. Now we move past the teens and into the 20s. On August 18th, 2020, while the original mansion was still closed because... It was late 2020, a new graphic novel was published by IDW, a young adult comic called The Haunted Mansion, Frights of Fancy. Yes, this is yet a third comic book continuity. Fourth, if you count the Disney Adventures comics set in the world of the movie. We open with an actual visible ghost host welcoming some foolish mortals to the mansion, but that's only a cameo. Our main character is the ghost of a young lady named Sydney Campbell, who's quite excited to join the world-famous Haunted Mansion. But Constance takes a disliking to her, so Constance is the antagonist. Not quite a scary, murderous antagonist this time, just like a hazing, mean girl antagonist. In the world building of this story, the mansion is both a retirement home for ghosts and a tourist attraction for the living, and the ghosts earn their keep by scaring the living guests. Unfortunately, Sydney is not a natural scarer, but she gets encouragement from the tightrope girl, who by this point was named Sarah Sally Slater. Sarah Sally Slater helps Sydney scare seashells by the sea, never mind. Sally's encouragement helps, but Constance challenges Sydney to make the place scarier than ever by the mansion's anniversary. Unfortunately, Constance sets Sydney up to fail further by teaming her up with some of the goofier ghosts. Yeah, in this comic, the dueling paintings are no longer scary threats in service of an evil pirate, they're just distracted bickering goofballs, but it's pretty funny. Things go poorly for a while, ghosts start leaving the mansion, Pickwick starts creeping on Sydney, which doesn't really end up going anywhere, and Sydney doesn't know what to do until she learns to use the strengths of the Gang of Misfits, whether it's recontextualizing their goofiness to be scary, or using their goofiness to lower a guest guard just before the real chills come later. So it's not an origin story for the mansion itself, but it is kind of an origin for the flow of the mansion attraction as we know it. And it's cute. It's another adaptation that I don't think I would want to be the Haunted Mansion story, but it's nice as 
as a Haunted Mansion story. Not every iconic character is part of the story. Leota only gets a cameo, the Hatbox Ghost is an extra, and I don't think the Hitchhikers are anywhere to be seen. I don't know if there was a specific goal for this comic to focus on some characters who weren't part of this comic, although uh, they couldn't resist using Constance as an antagonist again. Once again, we get little meta references, although not quite as intricately woven as they are in the Marvel comic. And in general, the story is much lighter than, well, basically all of the other adaptations that don't feature Mickey Mouse. It's aimed at a younger audience, but it's still a sweet little tale. And you know what? I ship Sydney and Sally. Can you feel the love tonight? That's why Pickwick was trying to swoop in. He knew if he didn't rush, Sydney would be Sally's dance partner forever. Then on July 13th, 2021, there was a new Little Golden Book of the Haunted Mansion. This one is not a coloring book. There is a grand tradition of Little Golden Books about Disneyland and Disneyland attractions, and this book is just about a kid riding the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland. It's not like a story about the Haunted Mansion, it's a kid rides the ride. So it almost doesn't count for this video, but uh, the illustrations are nice. Once again, I like seeing different art styles take on the mansion in these children's books. And I would say this is our most flattering children's book Leota yet. And then at the end, the hitchhiking ghosts do begin to follow the kid home. So yeah, that's the only thing that makes this count for this video is the fact that the hitchhiking ghosts are real. If it counts for Walt Disney World Inside Out, it counts for the Little Golden Book. Speaking of cute art styles, Chibi Tiny Tales. You know, the little segments where chibi versions of Disney XD characters do stuff. Some of them are theme park related stuff and one of them features the ghost and Molly McGee in Molly's Haunted Mansion. It features the titular Ghost and Molly McGee going through the Haunted Mansion. And I don't know enough about the Ghost of Molly McGee to know how ghosts work in the Ghost and Molly McGee. I hear good things about the Ghost of Molly McGee, I just haven't gotten to it yet. There's just way too much media out there, and I'm aware that I'm part of the problem making hour plus long videos two months in a row. Next month I'm doing something short. Anyway, this is another one where the characters go through the ride in order, and it's also another one where the characters harass the mansion instead of the other way around, but the mansion does fight back. Although, not with real weapons. Standards and practices. And Molly's sad she annoyed the ghosts, but they still follow her home anyway. It's cute. And then, two days after that Tiny Tale aired, October 8th, 2021, we got probably my favorite mansion adaptation so far. Possibly yours too. Muppets Haunted Mansion was a Disney Plus special that gave the Muppets treatment to the Haunted Mansion. The idea of a Muppets Halloween special had been in development hell for decades, and this was finally the piece of corporate synergy to make it happen. We were all excited for this. The Venn diagram of Disney Parks fans and Muppets fans is not a complete circle, but there's a lot more overlap than exclusivity. And Disney went all out in promoting this. There were promotional displays at Disneyland, in the Mr. Lincoln lobby, and outside the Esplanade. It was great to go to the home of the original Haunted Mansion and see promotion for Muppets Haunted Mansion. Even though, uh, I don't know why they didn't bother making the bus concave on this display, like that wouldn't have been any more expensive than making them not follow you. And also, uh, making us associate Muppets with 3D in Disneyland? Kind of a dick move. Now, Ali and I reviewed this special when it came out on our Patreon podcast, link in the description. Muppets Haunted Mansion came out today and we've already watched it twice. <laughs> yep. And, uh, yeah, we loved it. Yeah, it was wonderful. <laughs> okay, episode over. <laughs> <laughs> and now, looking back on it two years later, I still love it. Maybe it's not the best narrative, but as a jumble of things I like, it makes me happy. Essentially, the special treats the ride like a literary text, such as Christmas Carol or Treasure Island, and has the Muppets reenact it, but it also exists as a story in the Muppets world, so the Muppets are playing ghosts, but they're also playing themselves. I guess who I am? I'm Kermit! And Kermit is me, get it? They are pulling off the couple swap costume much better than Minnie and Daisy did. There's plenty of celebrity cameos, maybe too many. Some are inexplicable, and some are taking the roles of ghosts It would have been fun to see Muppets play, but I think the writers really wanted to make sure we don't see familiar Muppets as ghosts until we get inside the mansion. Everything here will seem familiar. But while some of the cameos are inexplicable, others make perfect sense. Is a smudge on the crystal again? Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Ugh, it's like taking care of my mother. With its short runtime, this special doesn't really have enough time to do everything it wants to do. 
both be a Muppet reenactment of the Haunted Mansion and an emotional story for Gonzo, but it still does the latter better than Muppets from Space did, and this special hits best when it's marrying Mansion and Muppet moments that just fit naturally together. Like matching the ballroom scene with At The Dance, or Statler and Waldorf's box with the Doom Buggy. The humor of the Muppets is not the exact same humor as the humor of the Mansion, but it blends a lot better than the humor of Eddie Murphy does. Don't worry folks, we're not gonna be explaining all the jokes. I like the original songs all okay. Putting the existing epitaphs to music makes a lot of sense, although I feel like the Imagineers who wrote all those deserve songwriting royalties. And the segue into Grim Grinning Ghosts works, even though the use of it is far too brief. The Be Our Guest slash Muppet Show theme mashup that is Life Hereafter is also pretty catchy, but the joke wears a bit thin. But again, the mashup of Mansion Architecture and the Muppet Show set is just Swedish chef's kiss. And parts of this just feel like it's making up for the mistakes of the Eddie Murphy movie, like doing a better job with the Stop the Wedding climax, and remembering when characters are driving away that there are hitchhikers. I like Will Arnett's take on the ghost host, and I love to Raji P. Henson as Constance. Speaking of Hensons, this is the first Muppet project in ages to have Brian Henson perform. Sadly, this might be because it was easier to get him back if he didn't have to share a set with Steve Whitmire. Almost every currently workable Muppet makes an appearance, which was apparently as much a budget-conscious thing as it was a fan service thing. They just had to use every resource they had. Being filmed pre-vaccine, there were a lot of shortcuts that had to be taken in production. It shot on those Mandalorian screens instead of real sets, and there seems to be as much digital animation in here as there is puppetry, which is... Probably inevitable when you're working with ghosts, but still, part of the appeal of both the ride's atmosphere and the Muppets at their best is how tactile everything seems, and that is missing here. But despite every nitpick I may have, this special has the heart I want from both the Muppets and the Mansion. Maybe some other adaptations were better at capturing the Mansion's scary side, but to date, this is far and away the best translation to another medium of the mansion's playfulness. And as far as I've been able to find, those are all the times Disney has adapted the Haunted Mansion thus far. But there's more on the way, the new movie is right around the corner, and we'll get a new novel from Claudia Gray not long after. Will either of those become the definitive Haunted Mansion story? I mean, I really hope they're both good, but of course not. The definitive Haunted Mansion story is yours. The feelings you feel when you enter the stretching room and board the doom buggy, whichever park you're in, the ghost story that happens to you, your theories about the mansion, your ideas about who these 999 happy haunts were, that's the definitive Haunted Mansion story. Every adaptation is just speculative, but how you feel when you're in the mansion, that's the real story. It happens to you and it just might follow you home. And I hope Disney continues to let all sorts of storytellers tell all different sorts of Haunted Mansion stories of their own for years to come. But in the meantime, which of these stories was your favorite? Which one was your least favorite? Which would you like to explore more of? Which of the worlds of these stories do you think are worthy of further examination? Let's discuss this all in the comments, and um, I'll see you after the new movie. And until then, this is Dave, signing off.